Thank you so much, Sue. Uh, I think it was maybe just a few more than 37 words that Sue used when she approached me one night in April or early May. It was a evening up in Hadley. I was about to go pick up some groceries at Whole Foods, and I hear, Marty, from across the parking lot, and it's Sue, and I'm just out of context, hey, Sue, how you doing? And she just immediately approached me and said, how do you like to serve on this Title IX steering committee for next year? And you know, entering now my 24th year at Springfield College, I've tried to cultivate some caution about taking on extra responsibilities because you pick up a lot. And so beginning, you know, learning to say no is an important skill. But I immediately said yes, because this was just something that Sue knew was near and dear to my heart, that it connected sports and social justice, which is so much of what has been important to me during my time at Springfield College. And so we just have a great, great day today. I'm so excited about it. We have four events. Any one of the four events, if we had them independently, would be a huge thing at Springfield College. Taken together, this is an absolute extravaganza. And it's all about Title IX, and it's all about women's basketball. We start off our first session today is the launch event for New York Times best-selling author Andrew Marinus, who's over here. And we have two members of the team that he has written about. He has written a wonderful new book called Inaugural Ballers. It's about the first US women's Olympic basketball team in 1976. It's a great history. He's a terrific, terrific writer. I've used his uh, baseball book that he wrote in a class, an athlete and lit class, which was received amazingly well on our campus. He writes these books that thread the needle about sports and social justice, so we have very, very common interests. We just met for the first time last night, went out to a great Vietnamese meal in Springfield. And we are thrilled to also welcome two members of that 1976 U.S. women's Olympic basketball team to the panel today, two Hall of Fame basketball players, uh, Julene Simpson, uh, who I believe has her silver medal from that Olympics with her that you'll be able to see at some point, and Ann Myers Drysdale, who has just been an absolute bright light in the game of basketball for so long, women's basketball, men's basketball. She just has an amazing story. So this is a phenomenal panel. If that was the, the full day, it would be great. But after that, we have a book signing after this first panel. And right after that, from 10.15 to 11.15, we have another great literary basketball event. Madeline Blaze, who is sitting here in the front row, is a writer's writer, a master author, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, just a beautiful, beautiful writer who wrote a book called In These Girls, Hope is a Muscle. And it is an account of a high school basketball team that played locally here in Western Massachusetts, the Amherst Regional Hurricanes. Uh, so this is gonna be their 30th anniversary season coming up. So that goes back a ways, but I am now old enough that I well remember that. I actually covered a lot of that season for a local newspaper. And so Maddie has graciously agreed to come down here. Ron Moyer, who is the, was the coach of that team, uh, who is one of the great storytellers around, is here. And there are three members of that team who will be here. That's going to be a great session. But we're not done, right? Uh, after a brief lunch break, we're going to come back here from 12.15 to 1.30 uh, for a conversation about all things women's basketball with two of the all-time, all-time greats in women's basketball. This is going to be co-moderated by Coach Graves, who's one of my people I most admire and most enjoy seeing on this campus, who is just an absolute icon of humanics and women's basketball and just all things that I believe in. And so I'm honored to co-moderate that panel with her as we have a conversation with Tamika Catchings and Tina Thompson two of the best players of, in the history of the game. Uh, and then we will finish things off at 2 o'clock 
when someone who describes herself in her Twitter bio as a quote unquote baller, uh, she's earned some fame in some other dimensions as well, but she's not here really for that purpose. But her name is Maura Healy. She's been in the news a little bit. She was uh, quite the player back in the day. She was a point guard at Harvard. She played professionally in Austria. And she will be going one-on-one -on -one with our president and just such an icon herself of Title IX and of strong women, Dr. Mary Beth Cooper. So what a day. What a day. So let me just actually set the stage for this book by first asking uh, Julene and Anne to share, to put this into context. 1976, uh, so we are talking 46 years ago. Uh, the author for that book who was here was all of six years old at the time, clearly taking very good notes though. And uh, two young players on that first team, Ann Myers and Julene Brzezinski Simpson, uh, were getting ready to play on that team. Could you each sort of talk about your journey to that moment? What were your lives like? What was your sense of what this was going to be like to be representing your country <laughs> on the first US women's Olympic basketball team? Well, <clears throat> Annie wants me to go first since I was a co-captain. I always got pushed to go first. So just a little bit background of, of uh, my history. I am from New Jersey, went to a college, very small college in Wahoo, Nebraska. It was called John F. Kennedy, and that was in 1970. And the reason why I went from New Jersey to Nebraska is because New Jersey colleges were just starting women's basketball, and they had a great schedule of 10 games, and they stayed in New Jersey. Going to um, Wahoo, Nebraska, it had 40 game schedule. We traveled four or five different states. And so went over to uh, Nebraska to play basketball. We won three titles there. And at the time, it was AAU basketball. Did not have AIAW, nor did it have NC2A. And a uh, little bit history there. Um, we hear about how AIAW and NC2A began to give athletic scholarships. When I went out in 1970, I did get an athletic scholarship for playing basketball. So my college was a little bit more advanced than many of the other major colleges. Um, I think we were only one of two colleges at the time that gave scholarships, and it was ourselves and the Flying Queens from uh, Wayland Baptist. And at that time, we did not really know that there was going to be a 1976 Olympic team. I did play on 11 international teams that represented the United States. Um, and the last team I played on was in 1976. And um, Annie and I played on a couple of teams prior to that. And when we heard that they were going to have the 76 Olympics, it was only about a year or so before. They still were not sure that they wanted to have women's basketball in the 76 Olympics. You have to remember, the men started in 1936, and so we were wondering how long it would be, and finally they go, okay, we're gonna have women's basketball in 76. However, we're not gonna do what the men do and bring 12, 15 teams in or so on and have pool play. We're gonna try it first time with only six teams. And so um, that, that experience, uh, we participated, there were four different um, regional tryouts, and uh, after, I think there were about 22 people that were selected for the finals, and uh, then they selected 12 and three alternates. So for me, it was a dream come true, but I just wanted to be on a first player to play in the NBA because there was nothing for the women for the WNBA, nor was there the Olympics at the time. So it was, it was a great honor, but it was, um, as I look back, I don't like to be called a pioneer, I like to be called a trailblazer. How about you, Annie? I grew up in Southern California. I have five brothers and five sisters, and my dad played basketball at Marquette, and so we were on sports in basketball all the time, and 
So the oldest in the family is my sister Patty, who is probably the best athlete, and she's eight years older than I was. So I saw women competing in softball and volleyball and basketball, and even though there was no Title IX, uh, there were women playing sports. So I get a little frustrated with young athletes today saying, well, we didn't have a role model. And uh, women have been playing sports for a long time, and internationally, uh, since the 1950s, uh, they've had international teams for women in, in basketball, but you had Wyoming Atias and Wilma Rudolph in track and field and Babe Dietrichson and uh, Althea Gibson. Um, you know, so many great women athletes back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, and so we've, we feel very fortunate to come along when we did uh, getting into Title IX. And as Julene said, AAU was kind of the space for women's basketball that were for older women, not like AAU is today for young kids to get an athletic scholarship. Uh, my brother David went to UCLA and played for Coach John Wooden, and David was on two national championships. And so in 1972, when Title IX was passed, uh, I played seven sports in high school. I was always playing with the boys and my brothers, and uh, so what I was doing was nothing different as far as playing the game of basketball, and uh, especially playing against the guys, because that's how I grew up. And uh, so in 1972, when it was passed, um, I had no idea as a high school kid what, what Title IX was. And I'm sure I would say the majority of the young people here do not know what Title IX is. And uh, when, when Sue was talking about 37 words, ESPN has done a, a three-part special. And I would encourage all of you to watch that documentary by ESPN, 37 words. And it gives you a little bit more explanation. And, and actually, Title IX was an education bill for equal pay for women. It had nothing to do with sports, even though it's become the, the calling card for women in sports. And, uh, and it still is imbalanced um, 50 years later. But in saying that, my dream was to go to the Olympics as a high jumper, and uh, because I read a book on Babe Diedrichsen. And even though track and field was very much a part of my life growing up, basketball was always there. And uh, so when basketball started to happen, and my brother David came home one weekend uh, playing at UCLA with his roommate, who was Kenny Washington, and played for Coach Wooden and won championships in 64, 65, he was going to be the women's coach and said, how would you like to come to UCLA on a basketball scholarship? And that's how I was recruited. And so I said, yep, and went to UCLA in 1975. I was a freshman. And uh, my brother David was a senior. They won the na national championship that year, the last championship that Coach Wooden coached. And um, so I had three different coaches at UCLA and along the way as a, as a freshman. Uh, but a actually, as a high school kid, um, I was on the first team as a high school player, the national team. And Julian, that's where I met Julian in 1974. And uh, we went around the country playing the Soviet Union and they had a center, uh, Uliana Semenova, who was as big as Sha Shaq. So um, their front line averaged 6'6", six, six, but it was an experience for me. Julian had already been playing USA basketball, and, uh, but that was my first experience as a high school player. And then going to UCLA, we went to the Pan Am Games, we went to the Jones Cup. So just the, the fact of being an athlete and representing your country and to be able to travel the world and meet people from other places, uh, and like she said, the tryout, too, for the Olympic team, not knowing whether there was going to be a team or not, we had to qualify out of those six countries, and, um, which was not going to be easy. But the regional tryouts, I mean, everybody and their mother came. You know, you could say, hey, I tried out for the Olympic team, and there were like 300 people in each region. Uh, we did not have social media. We did not have the Internet. We did not have computers. None of us knew anybody. Uh, from the south, from the east, from the midwest, the west. Uh, we had heard names if you had played in the AAU tournament. Uh, we had heard about Immaculata. We had heard about Del Delta State, which were three schools, that, uh, two schools that had won national championships. And, um, but I knew Julene from AAU because I had played on a team from the west coast, and she kicked my rear end. Um, but, you know, it was spattering of understanding who each person was or team was throughout the country because we had no knowledge of who anybody was. Now, I mean, you have AAU for young kids and they're traveling to Chicago or to Phoenix or to New York or whatever 
uh, as 12 year olds playing in tournaments and you're playing with kids that you will know the rest of your life and especially the internet gives you that opportunity too with YouTube and so forth. But we didn't know each other and uh, certainly even the coaches, some of the coaches really had to understand who they were and didn't interact throughout the country. And uh, so we also had to raise money for ourselves to fly ourselves to wherever we had to go. And uh, so anyways, so we make the team. Uh, we train in Warrensburg, Missouri, and uh, which was very competitive for all of us. And because we, was it 30 players that came, 25? I, yeah, I think it was 32 and they cut it down to 20 some. Yeah. And then eventually 15, like she said, there were three alternates. And, uh, but just to make that team, and so my dream came true, even though it wasn't through track and field, uh, it was on the basketball team. But we didn't know any of the politics that were going on uh, behind that. So uh, when we made that team, I was a, a sophomore at UCLA, and, um, and then would go on from there. Yeah, I would just po point it over here and said, you covered that. If you get a chance to read his book, it's phenomenal because it really tells the truth. You know, sometimes you read a book, you say, hey, what's going on? Is it, did that really happen? And when I read it, I thought, wow. I told him today, the first time I met him, I said, I looked at the book, uh, he sent it in. I was like, okay, how, how, am I in any of these pictures? I was like, oh, okay, then I can read it. And then I looked on every chapter to see where my name was. And there was a few, quite a few times. But the interesting thing, when I began to read the book, it really covers like the 70s of what happened and the trueness of the fight that we had. And the little, little steps we were taking, we look back now and they were major steps of the empowerment of that, of that uh, 76 team. And so let's uh, kick it over to Andrew with that wonderful endorsement. Uh, and I second that emotion very strongly. Now, as I mentioned, you were just six when this took place. So this was a real bit of research for you to conjure this time. Mm -hmm. And it was fascinating as I was looking through the book last night, you point to the game's origin, and I'm talking about the women's game origin, right here in Springfield, Massachusetts. We obviously know on this campus, and we have great pride about James Naismith hanging the peach baskets in 1891, and that's the one statue that we have right outside of this building. We know that story. We know that there's a deep history of both sports and social justice. Many people in this, this room have been part of that, that we had women's varsity sports ahead of Title IX here, which is something we're very proud of, that we had a women's basketball team. Our first one was undefeated and beat UConn its first year. That's all pretty cool history, but the history goes much farther back than that. I wonder if you could share with the audience the story of how girls and women were first exposed to the game of basketball? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question because um, I'm just sitting here sort of pinching myself that I'm in Springfield, Massachusetts. I mean, you guys take it for granted, but the birthplace of basketball. You think about every moment, every dunk, every shot, every great pass, every great player in the history of basketball, these two women next to me, the roots of any moment that you can imagine in basketball go back to right here uh, in Springfield. And so to have written a book about uh, an element of the history of the game and to be here to kick off a book uh, in this spot of all places in the whole world it means uh, an awful lot to me. Um, so I drove by the corner, uh, it's what, State, and what's the intersection there where the McDonald's is? Uh, Sherman, um, where <laughs> Springfield College used to be located, where the very first uh, basketball game was ever played. You know, it's the McDonald's now. Um, and the story goes that when uh, the first games were played, the first people ever to watch a game of basketball that weren't participating in it were women. They were teachers from an elementary school that was right uh, maybe a couple blocks away, it's not there anymore, Buckingham School. And so they were school teachers on their lunch break and they heard about this, uh, first of all, they heard the commotion as they were walking down the street. And they open the door and they walk in and there's these men shooting a soccer ball into a peach basket. You know, and so they were interested, what's going on here? And then they thought it was fun to watch. And so they would come back on their lunch break uh, and watch these basketball games and eventually, asked James Naismith if they could play too. 
and to his credit, he said, sure. But the problem was there were no other women in the world that had ever heard of basketball, so who were they going to play against? Um, and so it turned out it was the, the spouses, the um, girlfriends, teachers here at Springfield College that ended up playing uh, the first women's basketball games against these teachers uh, from Buckingham Elementary. And that's the roots of women's basketball go back to this school as well in that sense. Yeah, and so it, right at the start, it was 1891, the men's game, like December 1891, and it was by 1892 that women were playing basketball. And so I think the roots of women's hoop are right here at Springfield College as well. Fast forward several decades to the Olympics, the focus of this particular team. How did you get interested in that particular story? What was the, the genesis of the book? Now, this is my fourth book, and they all, as you sort of alluded to earlier, uh, relate to sports and history and social issues. <clears throat> so my first book is a biography of Perry Wallace, who was the Jackie Robinson figure of the Southeastern Conference. He was the first black basketball player in the SEC, went to Vanderbilt, which is my alma mater. I wrote a paper about him in college, so you college students, something that you do uh, during your experience here, that your college may stick with you for the rest of your life. And so that's what happened with me. That's why I wrote that book, um, going back to a paper. Uh, my second book uh, involves Springfield. I see Jeff Monceau back here, and uh, it's on the first U.S. men's Olympic basketball team, which played at the 1936 Olympics. James Naismith was able to travel to Berlin to see his invention. Imagine inventing a new game, and it becomes so popular within your own lifetime that you can see it played in the Olympics. What an experience that would be. Um, my third book is a biography of uh, Glenn Burke and Ann Myers Drysdale, her late husband Don Drysdale, a great Los Angeles Dodger. Glenn Burke played for the Dodgers. He's considered the first openly gay Major League Baseball player. I was traveling around the country speaking uh, about games of deception, the men's basketball book, and at two schools, one in Marion, North Carolina, which is, speaking of basketball, it's where Roy Williams, the great coach, was born, and in DeSoto, Kansas. So North Carolina and Kansas, two great basketball states. Students raised their hand and said, you're here to talk about the first men's team, but what was the first women's Olympic basketball team? These were middle schoolers that were asking those questions. And I had been thinking about the fact I wanted to write a book that involved women's athletics. But when the kids asked those questions, all I knew was that y'all had played in 1976, but I didn't know any of the story. That was the first Olympics that I remember. Uh, I think my first crush was on Nadia Comaneci, the great gymnast uh, at those Olympics. It's when I first met Maddie, our next speaker, and she's like a member of my family, I feel like, you know. Um, and so I went digging into the story. And um, when I learned the names of the people that were on that 76 team, learned the, uh, realized that you could tell the story in the context of the women's rights movement of the 1970s, and that this is a few years ago, and I'm thinking about it, that the book could potentially come out in 2022, the 50th anniversary of Title IX. It seemed to really make sense as a story um, who's, uh, I love telling stories of, of people who have not gotten the, necessarily the due that they deserve, you know, not the most well-known stories. Um, and so this was a chance to do that within the context of a social issue that really matters and the kids, I think, are, are hungering for right now. Great. Uh, kicking it back to Anne and Julene. So 1976 versus 2022, we are about to go into the WNBA finals after last night's exciting game. And the women's game is, is hot. It is something that has really captured the imagination of the American sporting public. It's growing. It's electric. It had, there's certainly room for a lot of growth, but the fan base is rapidly growing. Uh, we've certainly seen that kind of reception. Our women's basketball team last year was really the great athletic story on our campus. Um, Naomi Graves' team, which went, 20, I think, 24 and five, had this spirited run to the Sweet 16 of the NCAA tournament with this unbelievable buzzer-beating shot to get there. It was just a great, great story, and it really captured the imagination of this campus, I think more than any other team that was playing uh, last year on this campus. What sort of reception did you folks get in 1976? Was this something like, were you recognizable figures when you came away from this? What, what was the reception like? Well, as I mentioned, the, the, we didn't get a lot of fans. We didn't know each other, and let alone the media know us. So I want to ask, does anybody know who the Dream Team is? Any young people heard of the Dream Team? 
No? Yes. Okay, Put tell me who, who, Okay, tell me who the dream team is. Nineteen ninety two? The original dream team? Yeah. Who was on it? Do you know what that is? Anybody? Yeah, he said, he got, he said yeah. Jordan. He said Jordan. Jordan. Well he wasn't the only one that played on it. <laughs> but he he was also on the nineteen eighty four team, Michael Jordan. But the dream team in ninety two was the first time they had professional athletes uh, in basketball play in the Olympics. So when we went you know, as we were talking, we, we didn't know each other and how we had to try out for this team and pay our own way. Uh, we were all amateurs. We were all in college. And the Olympics back then were for amateur athletes. And uh, so 1972 is when things started changing for the men. And uh, so if anybody knows the history of the Olympics uh, and follow the basketball, whether it's the women or the men, 1972, we feel as a country that that medal was stolen from the Soviet Union. Uh, we had won the game, the USA had won the game, and uh, all of a sudden then the Soviets got three more chances to win and they won gold. Those guys on that team never accepted the medals. Uh, but again, they were all college kids, they went on to play in the NBA. We didn't have a league at the time when we made the 76 Olympic team. But in 1972, so 76 was our first year in the Olympics, and Dean Smith, who was a coach at North Carolina, they switched coaches. Hank Iba had been the coach for the last two or three Olympics. And uh, so since the United States didn't win gold or it was taken away from us, they changed coaches. It was the first time they ever had college kids that were from the same school. They had four guys from North Carolina, which that not, had not happened in the Olympics. 1936 was the first time it was a, it was a, a club, AAU team, AAU team, Sam Balter and those guys were on it. Um, but this was the first time that the college guys had four guys from one team. Um, Quinn Buckner was on the team from Indiana, uh, Walter Davis from North Carolina, Tom Ligardi, Mitch Kupchak, um, Adrian Dantley, you don't know those names. Um, so <laughs> in 76, it was our first year, but the men received so much recognition. Uh, and the Montreal, uh, 1976 uh, Olympics were in Montreal, which is right next to United States, so a lot of Americans were there. A lot of our families came to, to watch us play. Uh, and because we won silver, and first of all, we weren't ex even expected to go, uh, didn't have money for us to go, uh, we certainly make it to Montreal. Uh, certainly when we got to the village also, it was the first time they had security at that village because in 72, the Olympics uh, were the massacre of the Israeli athletes, and so they had a lot of security, but there was also talk that there was going to be a boycott. The United States was not going to compete in the 76 Olympics, which we did not compete in the 1980 Olympics. And, uh, but again, we were all college kids. And uh, now today, you have the WNBA, the NBA, the players are professionals competing in the Olympics. And when we competed against the Soviet Union, the Czech Republic, Bulgaria, Japan, those were teams that had players that had been on the team, they were in their late 20s, early 30s, and had been together 10 years, eight, 10 years. And that was their job for whatever company or the, the country that they were playing for. We were a bunch of college kids that had never even known each other. We were together, what, two months, two, yeah. six weeks? Six weeks, yeah. I, what I want you to think about in the 76, no social media at all. And the little that we did have it was very negative. First of all, our country was surprised that we even qualify because we qualified about a couple weeks, weeks before the Olympics. So we had done, you have to qualify at different uh, stages and we went to the world championships and, and did not qualify. So our only hope was uh, to go to McMaster University in Canada where they had your last resort and we weren't even supposed to win that. And we, we won and able to go. And you have to remember, they, we didn't really have a lot of financial back, uh, background uh, finance from USA Basketball. So once we qualified, the, that particular government was like, oh my goodness, that organization, we don't have any money. What are we going to do with them for two weeks? And finally, the, um, Bill Wall, who oh, yeah. was the um, executive director, he gave our head coach 
his personal credit card and said, try to figure out what you can do and for two weeks. We didn't know a lot of this going on. We yeah. didn't know until it was over. So we just thought, okay, fine. Um, and so anyway, we did find a couple places we were able to practice and, and go to. We went to Rochester, New York, That's because right. Kodak was the very first uh, corporate sponsor to get involved with uh, college basketball, women's college basketball. And Hunter Lowe was one of the top guys. And for whatever reason, in 1975, Kodak got involved. Now, you know, again, college for us was so different for you guys. You, have, you can transfer to any college you want to as an athlete. You've got the nil going on. Uh, you could not make money as a, as a college athlete. But Kodak was very, that was really, I mean, groundbreaking to have a, a corporation get involved with a college, especially for women's basketball throughout the country. And so when we had no money, Kodak in Rochester was not too far from Hamilton, Ontario, where we had to go qualify. Uh, we got to stay there, but I think the dorms were... Right, they were being renovated, but we still used them. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we even went to the lake, did a couple things, and... But the negativity that was, we weren't even supposed to qualify. Then we qualified, and I think one newspaper said we were the, not the worst, but the second worst team that was going to be there. And so I think it was really a shock uh, once we qualified and then we win a silver medal. I can tell you myself, Pat Summit, who was a, uh, also the co-captain and our head, head coach, head. Pat Head Summit. Uh, and the head coach, um, we went into the press room and it was like a closet. And there were four media people asking us questions. And the question was, wow, you know, are you surprised? Now we weren't, obviously, but from that point, I think Billy Moore had said it to the key. Before our game, our last game, that if we won the last game, we would get the silver medal. If we didn't win the last game, we would not get a medal along. And she just said, instead of pumping us up, she said something to the effect that we are playing for all the little girls out there. And that 25, we're going to make a difference in 25 years from the time that we were gonna play, we would really be looked upon as groundbreaking. And it was really powerful. So we went out thinking, okay, we're, we're gonna win this medal, we're gonna win this game. There was no doubt of what we were going to do. But as far as media goes, before and after, not, not much at all. And, I, and just to follow up, we were the first. We were the first. And like Julian says, we won the silver medal. Mm -hmm. And if you talk to athletes today, American athletes today, and if they're competing for gold, silver, bronze, and they don't win gold, another country wins gold, they say, oh, we lost. We lost the gold. Our attitude is that we won silver. And it's interesting because now you've got professional athletes that compete in the Olympics. As we said, we were amateurs, but we've had such a different approach because we were the first and there were no expectations from us. And even though 50 years later we've got the WNBA, which is not the very first women's pro league, the WBL was, which is 44 years ago. Um, but in saying that, even today, the WNBA, the negative media that even still, as exciting as the games are, uh, little ESPN or TNT or, or the NBA channel, and there's so many, much more because of the internet and uh, so many more outlets to, to watch. Women's basketball, women's sports still is not out there, and yet there is an audience. One thing I wanted to pick up on, so when you all think about the women's national team now, you think of uh, dominance, right? We think seven straight gold medals hardly ever losing a single game. I mean, it makes it even all the more impressive what you all were able to accomplish coming from finishing in eighth place in the World Championships the year before the Olympics. Um, and not only like literally what you accomplished in the Olympics, but all that you had overcome in terms of history, where in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, although there were women playing basketball and other sports, the predominant social attitudes were if you're a girl, you shouldn't sweat. If you're a girl, you shouldn't build muscles. If you're a girl, you should never even beat a boy. Annie, you had this experience, right, on the playground, running a race. You're gonna damage his ego, or a boy will never ask you on a date if you're competitive and you beat them in some sort of athletic competition. Um, 
most schools around the country didn't even really offer uh, competitive athletics uh, for young women, for girls. Colleges didn't. I think in 1971, typical athletic department in the country spent 1% of its budget on women's athletics. You know, so it was completely different, although there are still major challenges to solve today. There were hardly any opportunities, and the whole society was telling you, if you're a girl, you shouldn't even be playing. And so for these women to come from such different circumstances where Pat Head learned how to play basketball in a barn, you know, Lucy Harris, who was the high scorer on the team, grew up in the Mississippi Delta, the poorest part of the country, the same county where Emmett Till was murdered, you know, playing on a dirt uh, yard in the behind her, uh, basically a shack that she grew up in, right? Nancy Lieberman playing uh, on Long Island. Her mom was puncturing basketballs with a screwdriver because she didn't want her daughter to play sports, you know? So that, and then there's no promise, although any one, uh, both of you went to schools that did offer scholarships by the time you got there. In most cases, there is no promise if you were a great uh, girl basketball player that you could play in college. There is no hope of making money in a professional league or with endorsements. And even as you're growing up, no idea that you could potentially play in the Olympics until right before you actually got the opportunity. So what was driving these women to compete when everyone was telling them you shouldn't even be doing it and there's no great reward for doing it? So like what incredible determination and just sort of self-motivation uh, you all had and members of your generation to reach that point where you could be among the very best in the world and to win the silver medal. And you actually did win it. Like now you would lose the gold medal game and get the silver. The tournament was played differently in 76. It was just a round robin tournament. Whoever had the best record would win the gold. Whoever had the second best record would win the silver. So you were able to beat Czechoslovakia and celebrate winning a game that you knew won you the silver medal. So what an experience, and especially when you think about all that they overcame as individuals and overcoming so many societal uh, misconceptions and stereotypes. You remind me of the, uh, many of you do not hear the word tomboy anymore. But in the 70s, if you played sports, you were a tomboy, probably in the 80s too. And, and that, you know, I, when, I have an older brother and i two years older, and that's where I learned how to walk like the guy, spit like the guys, you know, do whatever the guys did. And my goal, uh, my husband's sitting over there and I always say uh, he should have a gold medal for as many times as he rebounded ball. I was the only one that was married at the time of the Olympics. Now, many, many women are married uh, that are participating in the Olympics. But, um, you know, it is very interesting because my goal was if I, when we had children, they were going to be called athletes. And many of you now sitting here in college, you see somebody that is so athletic, you don't say, and she's a female, you don't say, oh, wow, look, she's a tomboy. You go, wow, what a great athlete. Boy, it not, what a great female athlete. You say, what a great athlete. So I, I, I'm very proud that we were the front runners of the tomboys that became uh, for, for you all to be able to play and be called athletes. That speaks so eloquently, I think, to a, a place of progress. Obviously, there is a lot more progress that still needs to happen. We have about 10 minutes left of this session, and there's going to be an opportunity for anyone who is interested to meet our panel. There are books that are available out in the lobby for sale. It's a great, great book, great holiday gift that will be here before you know it. Uh, and, but I also wanted to give an opportunity for people in our audience, if you are sparked with some curiosity here, to ask some questions of either Andrew or Julian or Annie. I could keep going, but I'm just, you know, want to be fair about this. All right. Get my steps in now. It's great. Hello, I'm Corey Raftery. And uh, my question is for the both of you right there. Um, what uh, was it like being a woman uh, basketball player uh, and your experiences during your time as a basketball player? As I said, for me, I grew up with five brothers and five sisters. So I was always playing basketball with my brothers and being on the playgrounds. Um, I'm the only woman to have a tryout in the NBA. The WNBA did not exist at the time. Uh, I was the number one draft pick of the WBL, the Women's Professional Basketball League. So, you know, basketball became 
uh, obviously a part of my life that opened up so many doors for me to travel, to meet people, um, just to be where I am today. I, I'm a vice president and broadcaster for the Phoenix Mercury and the Phoenix Suns. And uh, so I would not have thought that basketball would have taken me still in the game uh, 45 years later to be a broadcaster with both broadcasting in the NBA. I've broadcast men's NCAA uh, championship games and the women's championship games, WNBA. Um, so the game has been very good to me. And I've been very fortunate to come along when I came along um, because of the opportunities it has afforded me. You get, get a sense with Annie with her life story, too, with the five brothers, five sisters. You've got, like, a guy's team, a girl's team, right in her family already. And she's there in the middle. But I had a great opportunity with uh, Chris Rim, who many of you know, who graduated from here not long ago. Uh, we do a podcast called Liberty, Justice, and Ball uh, on the intersection of basketball and social justice. And we had the opportunity to talk with Annie. And she's just, I mean, you get a sense of it here. She's just such a cannon shot of energy about all things basketball and a resource of history of both the women's game and the men's game that you just almost can't find anywhere else. It's just, just I mean, James Naismith has a really good partner right here. I'll say that. Um, as far as my experience as an athlete, um, I love to play the game. I could go out early in the morning and play till nighttime. Uh, a lot of time, I'm very competitive, so I want to know what the score was. Really? Uh, <laughs> 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 ah, yes, yes. And um, I love to play with the boys during my time. Um, you know, I, I'm a point guard, and I'm so glad I was because playing with the boys, you never get the ball. So my brother would say, you take the ball down the floor. And uh, so you, we, I played on the playgrounds. I had never really played in a gym until I got to high school because they did not have any girls basketball at all in elementary school. But um, the experience I had with the girls were not so good because I was very competitive. And they were, years ago, we used to call them girly girls because they had to put their makeup on and they had to, you know, be perfect before they got out and bows in their hair. And just really, at the time, I didn't understand that. I just wanted to play basketball. And, you know, it's Annie's track, and we have so many on our Olympic team have taken different courses uh, throughout their life. I had an opportunity to be a coach. I was at Arizona State, uh, Marshall University, Bucknell. Um, you look at my resume and you say, wow, you only stayed five years here, eight years there, and nine years. Um, and they used to call me the Red Adair of women's basketball. And the Red Adair, the, the gentleman, anytime there was an oil leak in the uh, ocean, they would call him to try to take care of the leak. And they'd call me that because if there was a problem in a college and they couldn't win, they would call me and I would uh, start up their program. And every place I've been within two to three years, I was coach of the year. And I don't know, I just got tired of like, okay, we won, now let's go to the next place. And I've been blessed uh, uh, after more than 50 years of uh, working. And so I just retired a couple years ago. So certainly enjoyed. And I, I know a lot of you guys have to go to class too in your next class. But I just wanted to reiterate in the sense of what Title IX is. And, uh, you know, we just lost Roe v. Wade. 50 years and women's choices. And this is just not about women's choices. It's about young men also as far as your choices and how you perceive things. And if you think you've got a sister or your mother or your grandmother or when you become you know, fathers, how your daughter is treated, the things that you say about them, how you treat a young girl or a young woman, whether it has to do with sex, whether it has to do with race, whether it has to do with religion, whether it has to do with age, and I think it's important that you understand that Title IX is just not a women's issue. It's an issue that affects everybody. And uh, whether it's equal pay or so many other issues that go on in our society. So I would you know, strongly encourage you to, to be understanding of what this law means. Because it very well could be taken away. And it affects so many other people. Yeah, I think that's incredibly important. Just because something's a law doesn't mean it will always <laughs> be enforced or always be in place as, as we've seen. And so, you know, 50 years later, Title IX, things don't always progress. 
right? That you could have these protections and, and rights for women, um, whether it's athletics or opportunities elsewhere in society taken away. And so it's important to understand the history so you know what you're fighting for to protect. Great, great message. It's not, the progress is not inexorable. Uh, every generation has that responsibility. Uh, next question here from Kathy Manga. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today. I enjoyed your presentation. Um, Annie, Annie, you just mentioned the importance of Title IX. Can um, all of you just briefly share with us um, some advice on how to advocate to secure and strengthen Title IX? I, I love the millennium. Is that what they call What are you guys, millenniums? What do, what do you call them? Gen Z. Now. Gen Z. It's like, you guys have a voice. You have the opportunity to vote. You can make change happen. And uh, that's so important. And, and you may not think that, you know, women had to fight for the, the right to vote. Blacks had to fight to get the vote. Black women didn't get the, the right to vote till way after white women got to vote. So, I mean, you make a difference. Don't think that your vote doesn't count. And no matter what party you're on or whatever, I don't, it's not about parties to me, it's about what is right. And I, I think you young people are so important in what's going on in society. And you can't overlook the importance and the power that you have in your voice. And, but you've got to be able to speak up. And I, I think the internet and social media has shown that so many people do have the power to make a difference. And uh, whether it's Title IX or, or any other issue, but you know, there's a lot of things that are being discussed right now in our legislature that you kind of scratch your head and, and why are we going backwards? And uh, it will affect so many people. Um, I, I didn't make, mean to make this a political thing, but you know, with us as women growing up too as young girls and how we were treated uh, just because we were athletes. Uh, I have a book that's called You Let Some Girl Beat You. So that title pertains not to just sports, but, but in, in life. And because I think it's very difficult for young men to say, their buddies say to them, oh, you let a girl beat you? Whether you're applying for a job or whatever. And so your psyche is hard, and that's how we, we still think today. And uh, so I, I have three children. I have two sons and a daughter, and uh, you know, trying to make them understand the balance and, and trying to be fair. And uh, certainly you're going to have your own thoughts because of what you listen to and who you listen to. And um, you know, basketball for us, as we said, it, it's opened up so many doors for us in so many ways, but it also has opened up the doors for us to understand other cultures and women that we played with that we had no idea what part of the country they came from or how they grew up. And we're not together very long, like the WNBA players and those players that come together that you'll get to listen to Tina and, and Tamika, they come from a very different place than what that we did. And, and as black women too, in this country, what they have had to go through is very different than what Julina and I have gone through. But you know, it was a time too that they had more things offered to them than we did that we had to fight. But this fight still goes on. Right. I think we have time. We're doing one more question. Uh, actually, thank you for everything. You actually just touched on it. When I too was called a Tom girl, it didn't take many years before I then began to hear Uncle Tom. And the intersectional piece of bias became powerful. So I wanted you to share some moments about racist things that you saw or felt as young people in your own experience. Well, I want to answer a little bit of both of your questions. So um, Andy was talking about the importance of young people using their voice. And related to Title IX, I think it's important that young men use their voice also. And so. My books um, use sports as a way to encourage young people to get involved in social issues. So the first book really deals with racism. The second book, anti-Semitism. Third book, homophobia. This book, sexism and feminism. And I, I'm thinking, how do you get a middle school boy or high school boy to pick up a book about the women's rights movement in the 1970s? Maybe it's by making it about a US Olympic basketball team. You know, and so to be thinking about these issues and to be thinking about equity and equality in Title IX through a sports story. Um, your story, your question, um, there were four black women on the 1976 
Olympic basketball team, um, among the first four uh, black women to play on any U.S. national team. It had only been a couple years since um, the teams were desegregated. Um, have you seen the documentary on Lucy Harris called The Queen of Basketball? Uh, she was um, the leading scorer on their team, scored the first basket in Olympic history, won an Oscar last year, just a phenomenal movie. And I think what that movie uh, points to in Lucy's story is just um, lack of opportunity. You know, here she was, just like these women, among the best basketball players in the world. And but once beyond the Olympics, what opportunity was there for you? You know, um, especially compared to their male peers where we drafted in the NBA, we get endorsement deals and coming rich off of the skills that they had worked so hard um, to, to crew. But Lucy came up, as I mentioned, the same county as Emmett Till. She's um, probably the best known woman from the Mississippi Delta other than Fannie Lou Hamer, you know, and is overcoming the same uh, racism and fighting against it in her own way by excelling and, and uh, overcoming every sort of obstacle and stereotype that had put in front of her um, to reach the international stage and then is left with zero opportunities. And so um, I see that as sort of a microcosm of lack of opportunities that were there for black women in general at that time. And I think the WNBA, I think the women during COVID had a huge voice with what's happened with Brittany Griner and uh, also Black Lives Matter. I think Natasha Cloud, Neka Gumake, um, so many other women in the WNBA, which is probably 80%, 85% uh, African-American women. And uh, their voices made a difference. They changed the vote in Georgia. The WNBA women changed the vote in Georgia. And so that, that shows you how powerful your voices can be, uh, but you have to band together. And, and the WNBA has done that. I think that issue of platform is one of the biggest differences from 76 to now. You, you guys are making a statement just by being on the court, but you didn't have the ability you didn't have social media. You didn't have too many men sports writers that were taking an interest in women's athletics. So you were making a huge statement. But uh, today, just as you mentioned, um, women athletes, I think, have been, they influenced the Senate race. Um, they've fought for equity and pay in women's soccer, you know, and uh, have shown that you can use your platform as an athlete to affect great change. I just want to thank our panelists so much. You have set the bar way above that 10-foot rim for our other three panels. Uh, I love what you're all about. This is exactly what we were hoping for. I appreciate your candor, your eloquence, your vision. Um, this is really a perfect start to a great, great day at Springfield College. So thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And please join Andrew, Julene, and Annie out in the lobby to chat with them, buy some books. They'll be happy to sign them. Uh, our next panel will begin in 15 minutes. That's uh, the one on In These Girls, Hope is a Muscle. Okay, welcome back to our second session for 9 9 for Title IX, the history of women's basketball. The number nine, it's kind of a magical number, right? Mathematically, right? We know 9, 18, you add up the digits, you get 9, 27, you add up the digits, you get 9, 36, that sort of stuff. As a big baseball fan, 9 was always a big number to me, too, right? Nine innings, nine players on the field. But today it's about basketball. Okay, not when we realized that this was the 50th anniversary of Title IX and that we wanted to launch our celebration of that at the beginning of the school year, and then it was convenient that Friday, September 9th, was right at the first week of the school. It just seemed too good to resist. And so we got things off to a rollicking start with our first panel, fantastic. Uh, Andrew Marinus, New York Times best-selling author, is out in the lobby signing copies of his book, which I highly, highly recommend. Two members of that 1976 U.S. Olympic team, Julian Simpson and Ann Myers Drysdale, are out there as well. They were so candid, forthright, eloquent. It was great. And as I said, they raised the bar very high, but I know 
that this next panel is going to rise to that and it's going to be like a pole vault. They're going to angle their bodies over it and uh, keep things moving on up. Uh, so very, very exciting. I, I want to, anybody watch that uh, WNBA game last night? Wow, right? Do you see the way that thing ended? 18 to nothing run to end the game. The Connecticut Sun vaulting into the finals have a chance to win their first championship, right? Pretty cool. Uh, and that's like overwhelming. 18 points in a row for one team over another team. You almost never see that, that much of a run in a game. It got me thinking, like, what's like the all-time run? The all-time, like, if we could go back, you know, to Naismith's time, 1891, what was the moment when one team scored the most points in a row over the other team? And maybe it's the Harlem Globetrotters over the Washington Generals. I don't know. But I looked, I tried to do a Google on the WNBA biggest run of all time. I couldn't find it anywhere. I looked in the NBA and I saw that there was a stat for that. NBA has been going for 75 years and twice in NBA history, there was a run of 29 straight points. Try to imagine that. 29 points that one team scores without the other team scoring a single point. What an overwhelming swing in a game. Just colossal momentum. I mean, it just seems almost incomprehensible that that could happen. 29 to nothing run. All that to introduce uh, our second panel, which is a look back on a moment in both local and national history in terms of women's basketball that took place up the road in Amherst, Massachusetts, 1992-1993. Uh, so this is gonna be the 30th anniversary season for this high school team. Amazingly enough, and every team, I mean everyone, I think most people who are in here either play on teams or have played on teams, and we know the drama of team sports, right? Every single season is a story, right? Every season is a story. It has drama, it has a rise and fall, it has hopes, it has heartbreak. Every single season for every team. It's part of the, what makes sports so compelling is the narrative, finding the story. Once in a while, there is a team that has a story that is worth writing a book about. And once in a great while, there is a team that is, it's worth having a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist write a book about. And that's what happened with the 1992-93 Amherst Regional Hurricanes. And this is a team I feel very close to in my own memory because I, before I came here to Springfield College, I was a full-time journalist and I worked for a local paper up in Northampton, the Daily Hampshire Gazette. And I absolutely lucked out to come in at an amazing time in local sports. I got the beat job for the UMass men's basketball team, which was, you know, writing an amazing story at the time. And I got to cover some amazing, amazing high school sports, including and probably headed up by this particular team, the Amherst Regional Hurricanes in 92-93, which had been a great team for a number of, of years. They'd had posted tremendous records. They had you know, gone into the playoffs with great expectations, had won playoff games, had pushed things close to her championships. For, they have a regional championship here, the Western Mass Championship, that's a big deal. They had some great, great players on the team, and they always fell just a little bit short. And then came this year, 1992-93. It was a year of pure magic for this team. And the, they won and won and won and won. They lost one game, I think, in the regular season. They won that elusive Western Mass Championship. They beat the Central Mass Champion to get to the state championship game where they were going up against a very imposing foe, okay? This team from Haverhill, right? Is that right? The Haverhill Hillies. 
that might not sound too menacing to you, the Haverhill Hillies, but they were the defending state champions. They had been in the state championship game five of the last seven years, which is rather incredible. And also, it's worth noting that generally speaking, back in those days at least, that the championship team, the Eastern Mass champion, was a prohibitive favorite against the Western Mass. Western Mass, smaller population, smaller schools, and generally speaking, a bigger pool of athletes in these Eastern Mass schools. And so, given all this, this team, and this, they had these towering, I mean, all of these young women on this team who I was looking up to as a, I just, they were of huge favorites. And in, they, in fact, they scored the first basket of the game pretty quickly and went up to nothing against Amherst. And then Amherst had a nice little surge. They were ahead, uh, I think, six to four at one point. And then let's just go, Sue, maybe you can help me here. I'm just gonna show you one minute of a stretch of this game. Haverhill's been in it, I believe, what, five out of the last seven years? Haverhill squad is a regular visitor to this particular ball game. Great tradition they built uh, under Kevin Wolfson there. And Haverhill using our sides. The shot is missed, and rebound is missed. Great rebound by Haverhill Shore that time. It's by you. Missed two shots. Here come the Kings. Here comes Weidman. Weidman to give it to the 15-footer, and she'll take that and misses. Kristen Marvin with a rebound. Looks to drive. Pulls it back outside to Jamila. Right in front of us. Throws up a three. Wins it. Weidman. A little unusual. How much heart can that shot, Mike? You're a little too good leaving your hand, but uh, Jamila knows better than we what's going to work for her. Nine for Cage. Jamila's still going to the Kings. Here comes Weidman. Weidman with a rebound. Weidman with a rebound. Two on the shot. I mean... All right, so that's just a tiny stretch of this game. That was, you know, a couple of nice hoops. Jamila Weidman with this, you know, sweet-looking three from the corner. Gets the steal, dishes to Jen Pariso. She does this great little reverse, flicks this thing up. I mean, that was a sweet little stretch of the game, right? And they're up 11-4. It seems like it could still go either way. Um, the score at the halftime of that game was 51-6. to 51-6. to six. And during the end of the first half and the beginning of the second half, Amherst Regional went on a 37-0 to zero run. 37 straight points against the defending state champions, a team that had been in the state championship game five of seven games. Amherst 37 points in a row, and obviously one going away. And we saw a couple of the great players on that, that team, Jamila Weidman, who went on to, to big things. She was a remarkable high school basketball player uh, who went on to Stanford and then the WNBA. She was a, get this, four-year captain at Stanford. I mean, who does that? You're a captain your first year at college? And that's, you know, it's not exactly chopped liver, Stanford. They were the defending national champions. Uh, Jen Pariseau, phenomenal, phenomenal player in her own right, went and played at, at Dartmouth. And there were other great, great players. This was a team with a capital T. It was an amazing team. And we are so happy to bring back a couple of members of that team Kristen Keller, who was Kristen Marvin back in the day, who's over here, who grabbed that nice rebound in there, right? Uh, and Rita Powell, who a was a member of that team as well. So they are here. The coach from that team, Ron Moyer, uh, who you will see is just an amazing storyteller, who has, was a, just a a gift to this team and they to him. It was just a beautiful thing what they experienced. And then the, he had the great good fortune 
to team up with a baller in the literary sense, uh, Madeline Blaze, who is, as I said in the last session, a writer's writer, someone who works incredibly hard at crafting beautiful sentences and crafts one after another, after another, after another. And she wrote this memorable book. It is a classic work of nonfiction. It's called In These Girls, Hope is a Muscle. Uh, it is also available out in the hall. She will be happy to sign copies of it. This is a book that is on major, major lists. Sports Illustrated has it as one of the top 100 sports books of all time. Yard Barker recently had it as one of the top 25 sports books of all time. It is a beautiful account of young women coming of age, the power of team. All of this a little bit ahead of Rebecca Lobo going to UConn and the WNBA. It was a remarkable time. It's so cool to bring them back. And I want to bring Maddie Blaze up to sort of set the stage about how, what it was about this team that you felt was worthy of book level treatment. Hello there, everyone. Special thanks to the students who are here. I know from my own undergraduate years and from teaching undergraduates at the University of Massachusetts how much it means to have these special presentations that your, that your faculty work so hard to put together for you. And I hope that today we say some things that you will remember for 25 years, if not for forever, and maybe help shape some of your life decisions as was enunciated in the first panel today. If basketball is literally about making the connection between a ball and a hoop, life is more abstractly about making connections. And I feel very pleased to be able to express my gratitude to so many people in this room who helped put this event together with whom I have a connection. Murdy was a wonderful source for my book. And when it came time to quote him copiously in the final version, he gave his permission without hesitation. I want to say hello to uh, Jeffrey Monso. I see that he was a librarian here at Springfield College. He was cited by Andrew Marinus in the previous panel as being helpful with his book. Well, he's helped me with my new book, which is coming out next summer, about a woman who was a tennis player in her era, the greatest of all time, the Serena of her day, and he allowed me to sit in the library day after day for several weeks with a helper, my sister, and go through many American lawn tennis magazines, et cetera, to get to the story I needed to tell. It was the resources here at this institution that in some ways have provided the backbone, backbone of what I will be doing next. I also uh, want to say that Andrew Marinus is indeed an old, old friend. I guess I'd say that I met him when I was in my 20s. He was five years old, so I met him a year before he started Inaugural Ballers. And he was always a wonderful little kid. He, people always said he was the kind of little kid that made other people want to have children. And I feel that way about him to this day. I will also say that he's a great believer in Title IX, as evidenced by his daughter, who I met when she was three, wearing her soccer uniform. She was part of a, a team, a real powerhouse in Nashville, known as the Mighty Pink Unicorns. So I get to also thank these wonderful people on the panel today. I want to say that perhaps the best way to introduce them is to explain to you how I came to cover this story in the first place, which is I had moved to Amherst. I was vaguely aware in 91 to 92 that there was a girls basketball team that was taking over the town, at least to some degree, not the way it did a year later. And at one point, I had hired a babysitter to help me with my two children, who were then six and 10. The sitter couldn't come, and instead, she sent a sub from the bench, Kristen Marvin. So Kristen came to help me with my two kids and, uh, while I was trying to get some work done. And she decided that the best way to babysit was to just play basketball with them at the in the communal hoop in the yard. 
that we shared with other people. And my son at 10 looked at her play and said, I didn't think girls could do that. And she said, Buster. And he said, OK, I see now. And my six-year-old daughter said, I want to be like her. And I talked to Kristen about the team that she was on. And she explained that they'd, they were a good team, but they had this problem at the end of the season. They always clutched. And she said, but next year is going to be so different. And I said, why? And she said, well, coach said so. I said, OK. And then she said, but really, all my friends are training. And they were training. Her friends were taking advantage of the town of Amherst, running around, uh, jogging, running, whatever you want to call it, day and night. Some of them were practicing by themselves after their teenage summer jobs at the, one of the local public schools, which had a rusty hoop. They take their mother's car, put the headlights on, and play by themselves, just trying to shoot baskets. Other, other young women would run up and down the, the steps at the stadium of UMass and just challenge themselves to get stronger, stronger, stronger. And what I then vowed was not to write a story. I didn't sense how great a story it was at that moment. I just thought, gee, it'd be really nice to take the kids to some games this winter because it sounds like a really good activity, a good family activity, and I think I should try to do that. So I did. Uh, take them to some games. And what happened was, the first game I went to, I could not believe what I was seeing. It was as if the world had gone from black and white to technicolor in terms of young women and how they were being regarded as athletes. Before anyone in this room says, were you ever an athlete, let me just say no. However, I was competitive. And I loved seeing these young women almost heedless of their bodies, be able to express through their bodies a conversation about a game that means a great deal, obviously, to a great many people. Do it in, and to do it in a fashion that was attracting a great many townspeople and just regular folk to come and watch and see and support them and see what they were doing. Uh, as, a, as a result of seeing them, I began to think this is a good story. And by a series of fortunate uh, connections, again. I knew the editor of the uh, New York Times Magazine. And I had sent him a note a few months before when he got the job. And I said, congratulations on your job. I'd love to do something for you sometime. Because I wasn't a complete idiot. <laughs> At any rate, he was in touch. And he, 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 after that, he talked to me about some story ideas. And it turned out that he was, in fact, someone who was very passionate about rights and opportunities. And the reason he was, and I didn't know this at the time, but he had moved to this country at the age of one from Germany in 1939. And he had never forgotten, from the family point of view, what his family had fled, what they had fled to, and how, growing up in Portland, Oregon, he got opportunity after opportunity, after opportunity ended up at Harvard, ended up at the New York Times, ended up creating opportunities for many people. And when I talked to him about this team, he understood perfectly, without me even having to say a great deal, what was happening and how there was a cultural shift that was allowing these, these young women to express themselves this way, to get this kind of attention, and to have it seem in some ways both wonderful and also almost normal. So he said, sure, I'd love to see the story. I told him about the two captains, uh, uh, Jen Pariseau and Jamila Weidman, who you saw on the, uh, the film strip, uh, and how Jamila was uh, from, uh, her, fa her family had, her father worked at the university, her family had moved to Amherst from out of town. She was biracial. Jen was a white kid from uh, the town of Pelham. Her father worked for the town in, uh, as, a, as a town engineer. And so it was a, like a town gown thing. It was uh, these two young girls, this and that. Uh, it just, it just everything seemed to kind of pile up on each other in terms of the many themes that were worth exploring, up to and including exploring the town of Amherst as an odd place to have created this this great team, in in the sense that Amherst is, as many people here know, often referred to as a place that's, um, uh, you know, a, a citadel of wishful thinking and not usually a citadel of, uh, of, of great, great uh, state championships. 
I guess the person to really thank for that, though, is Ron Moyer, the coach who had worked so hard with teams previous to the one that, that did so beautifully, and had put in his time year after year trying to give young women the same opportunities that he had had as a young man growing up and uh, attending Lafayette College on scholarship, I believe, and being, were you the, the champion rebounder? Is that right, Ron? Something like that? Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> he, he, um, uh, and, he, he, and he also the father of two daughters. So he knew, as I did, that if you are a parent of a daughter, whether you're a father or a mother, it's always a fraught feeling about how they will be received by society. That you, you may also have about your sons, you have different kinds of worries. But about your daughter, you worry about internalizing messages of negativity and internalizing, at times, a lack of opportunity. So when I wrote this book, I know I was covering a game and, and, and covering a team and trying to understand what that dynamic meant. But I also think I was doing a scouting report on the opportunities I wanted my own daughter then, as I said, six, and her friends to have. So it was partly, partly a book about how to raise daughters as well as a sports book. That said, I'm going to sit down, I think, and, and allow the, uh, are, are you going to run the, uh, well, we'll figure this out. Okay. Thank you, Maddie. That's a great framing. Uh, Thank you, Maddie. Very, very helpful. And so I want to start off by kicking it to the two former players, uh, Kristin and Rita, and to ask you, Maddie was referring to this as sort of a cultural shift that at the same time sort of felt sort of normal. Were you aware of it as a cultural shift or was this just like what you were doing growing up in Amherst? Did it feel like it was something special at the time? Speaking for myself specifically, um, I n was acutely aware that we had something special, yes. Um, I'm not sure I was mature and wise enough to understand macro cultural shifts <laughs> at that point at 16, 17, and you know, appreciate what it might have meant, especially to people of you know an earlier generation. Um, I think, especially growing up in Amherst, um, we had already lived in a lot of ways ahead of our time in terms of how the community and the school and everything else provided a pretty um, equal level of opportunity across different areas. Um, where you really felt it, and I think probably what you were referring to, Maddie, I think when it got to the point, especially in that last year, where our games would sell out on Friday nights and people would be lined up in the hallway and it would be, you know, like Friday night light football is in some places, but it was girls basketball on a Friday night. Then you knew like, wow, this, this is not even in the best of cases how it's normally done. And that felt special, special and that is when at a cultural level, um, we start to become aware that, wow, this is, this is actually becoming something more than just a really special team. Um, and I can say, first of all, I'm, my mom's here. Hi, mom. <laughs> um, I mentioned that only because um, my mom was an athlete in a different generation. And so I was definitely aware that, um, that like I was already in, a, in my own family culture aware that women's sports was something to celebrate and to be proud of. Um, but yeah, the, the, I was, and my place on the team, I, I was like the, the, the little kid, like hanging on to the, to the coattails and really happy to be along for the ride. But what I have realized is so special for me was that I didn't have to feel that there was a shift or that there was anything strange. I just got to be part of an amazing women's basketball program as though that was my right. Um, and I realize only later that that actually is the result of a shift um, and something really special. Yeah, very well said, both of you. And it does, uh, Kristen, when you talk about those games selling out on Friday night, I can vividly remember just that, that sense of excitement. This was, this was the best show in town. I mean, there were some really good, exciting boys basketball teams there that were just 
nowhere near as interesting as this team. This was the story. You could sense the build, you could sense the vibe. There was just something about this group of young women that was electric, it was magnetic. Um, there was this whole group of young girls in Amherst who were looking, I think that was the year there was like this first time there was this youth girls basketball league, like 120 girls, I think you devoted, the, Maddie has this in the book, I believe, that they uh, dedicated the season to this group. Ron, you had been part of this, uh, you've been the coach of this team. A lot of these girls had actually, there's some of them who'd played for you for six years, it's unusual, and with a regional high school that you can, you know, go out for varsity basketball as of seventh grade. Uh, Jamila played all six years. I think Jen was f a five-year varsity player. Um, you had had really good teams, great records, great experiences, had not won ultimately the championship. What was it like for you as you look back, the beginning of this senior year? You knew it was gonna be the last, you always say goodbyes, they're almost always seniors on a team, it's always hard. But this was a group, you were gonna be saying some hard goodbyes. What was your feeling as that year began? Well, thanks, uh, Marty. I must be getting old, I remember when Maddie was the English professor and you were the sports reporter. <laughs> So, a dinosaur looking for a museum. Um, what I remember is that last bus ride the year before when we stubbed our toe fairly badly in a Western Mass tournament and uh, a nice dark bus ride back, a dark parking lot, and a crying group of athletes that were so upset with themselves they didn't know what to do. And, uh, had to console everybody. I told them I didn't coach them up enough, but that we were going to be back. And I gave it the Arnold, we'll be back. <laughs> but you're going to have to do some work, and I'm going to have to change some things up. And uh, that was the moment, I think, that uh, we knew that we had something special, and we just disappointed ourselves. And I have to hand it to the kids and the captains, and they just they started their work. A lot of AAU basketball, a lot of individual stuff was done. And uh, coach changed things up a little bit. If you notice a little bit of the fast break, um, we changed everything up. We, we just weren't tall enough to compete with a lot of these teams. But um, when Jamil had the ball flying up the middle of the court, she looked pretty tall. And uh, if you notice everybody running lanes, usually you watch a basketball game of guys, I, I've been watching AAU all summer, guys run up the middle of the floor and you can't do anything. I said, give the middle of the floor to Jamila. And I told Jamila, you get the ball first, and if they won't give it to you, go and let them have it, but then steal it from them. And then you take the ball up the court. And then we had uh, people running their lanes, and every, uh, she knew where everybody was going to be, but she had the entire court. So the more she had the ball, the smarter I looked. So I, I kind of changed it up, so we gave the ball to Jamila and let her make a lot of the decisions. I remember you telling me many years ago, Ron, talking about Jamila. Uh, I remember writing a, a column at the end of the season about the Jamila and Jen connection and asking you to reflect back on when she first arrived and came out for the team in seventh grade. And Jamila has, I mean, there's so many parts of her story that are quite fascinating, one of which is that she was a, born very, very prematurely. Uh, it was like a pound and a half or something she like that. Really just, and, I mean, didn't, she would didn't think she would survive and she was in this incubator for a long time, and when she comes out for this team in seventh grade, she was, I think the direct quote from Ron is that she was basically a ponytail and a bouncing ball. That was his, his description. That was a uh, you know, classic Ron Moyer description. But uh, you know, she obviously was the starting point of this team, but she by herself was not gonna win any championships, and she and Jen Pariseau as, you know, who would have been the best player on pretty much every team in Western Massachusetts, but was the second best player on this team. Even the two of them, they weren't going to win any championships. Basketball is a team game. And I was wondering, uh, Kristen and Rita, if you can talk about how that sort of team identity was forged. What was it like as you guys, I mean, there was just an amazing chemistry and a, a sisterhood, a sense, I mean, the, the team as family is such a cliche, 
every team says that at some point, but this team really, you felt that vibe so strongly. How was that built? Um, I, you know, I think it's, it's a combination of a couple of things. I think first and foremost, every player on that team was full of humility and full of respect for each other and what everybody brought. No one considered themselves better than anyone else. They, they totally understand, understood what you, what you just said, Marty. It takes a team. Um, and we prioritize team over the individual. And in addition, coach would never have tolerated anything other than that. And he taught that. And he taught how to function and play as a team. The plays that he designed, of course, he you know, put the right people in the right positions to take advantage of everybody's strengths. But it was always about playing as a team. Um, and so the combination of his really gifted coaching and just the, the character and the integrity and the humility of the people on the team and just a real investment in each other um, and relationships. And, you know, we weren't all best friends. We didn't all have sleepovers every weekend, you know, we, we, but when we were together and we were playing, we were sisters and we were wholly dedicated to each other. Um, and that true manifestation of team where the whole is greater than any single individual is really hard to accomplish. And I say that as someone who's been leading and building teams in the corporate world for 25 years now, um, and people use the word team very loosely, um, which is a personal irritation of mine, because just because you're a few people around a conference room table in a room or on a court does not make you a team. A team takes real sacrifice and dedication and commitment and, um, again, the putting the group ahead of yourself. Yeah, one thing, um, I was thinking about the, the panel previously too and speaking about the way in which basketball or any sport, but basketball is not separated or distinct from the community that you're in. So I appreciate Maddie just kind of locating and framing part of what happened, part of how this team was able to come into being was because it was integrated into the community in different ways. And that was also part of some of what I have carried with me most uh, closely from Coach Moyer is this sense that as athletes, we were not just accountable to our games or even to our team, but to our town in some real way, that there were the, the phrase, little eyes are watching you, is one I've never been able to shake. Um, and that's also my personal experience with the team. Part of why I felt my heart so set on fire on that team was because Jen Pariso, amazing, shiny captain, cared about me, kind of low life, you know, like two years younger, not, not the Olympian, um, but she cared about me. And she not just, she, not only did she care about me in terms of bringing me into the team, she, she insisted that I find a way to be generous with my classmates. That I, that I not just be about myself when I was walking the halls, but that I was turned outward. That was something that she taught me and that both brought me into the team, but also is part of what made me belong in my community in general. So I think the way those two things go together, I think is part of what was so potent about this experience. Very, very well said, both of you. And you both reference Ron and his coaching. It's a curious alchemy you know, coaching and athletes. I mean, that relationship is a unique, unique relationship. It's a coach is a, in a position of great power with a team because that you're pulling together a group in a pursuit that everybody is really passionate about. It's a little different sometimes in the high school classroom. I used to be a high school teacher myself long ago. And not everybody who's in the high school classroom, unlike some of my students who are here today who are totally fired up about being in my classroom all the time. But in high school, that's not always the case, right? It's, and it's, but on a, in a sport situation, this is, it's all voluntary, right? And people are really impassioned about it. And a coach controls a lot about what happens, your playing time, those sorts of things. I know a lot of people have to head off to class, but thank you for joining us. We'll just keep rolling right through this. I think there'll be some more people joining us. 
Um, and I'm curious if you both could talk a little bit about your sense of Ron Moyer's role in all this. Ron is an imposing person physically. I don't know, he's, you know, seated here. But if he stands, I mean, the guy is still, how he's like 6'6", six, six. he's not, you know, he's, he's a presence. He is a very considerable presence. And uh, you're young high school girls, and what was it about Ron that was just such, so compelling? Why was he the perfect person to coach this team? Um, well, so again, I, on the younger end of things, I got to play for coach after, the two years after the big win, um, which is also important that the big win was one thing, but actually there was basketball that happened after that that um, was really meaningful to me anyways. <laughs> and um, yeah, I guess there, it, it is really interesting, but the sense that um, to have a really, to have somebody of, of Coach Moyer's stature uh, literally and figuratively, uh, to feel like you are a young woman moving in the world with somebody like that behind you, and you knew behind you to the death, and <laughs> to, the, to the ages, that's really intense. And that's something I've taken with me. That's not something that I've experienced in other parts of my life, in other chapters of my life. I've not always had somebody like that just behind me, utterly believing in me and utterly committed to my uh, evolution, to my progress, to my capacity. Um, so that, that was, that's pretty powerful. <laughs> Um, I would, I would, well, first of all, he, he may be tall, but he's a big teddy bear. <laughs> um, not to, not to ruin your reputation. Um, I think the greatest thing about Coach Moyer is he was able to see everything you were capable of, even when you didn't. And he would push you and push you and push you. But he helped you not only to achieve that potential, but to see it in yourself, which I think is one of the greatest gifts that you can especially give an adolescent girl. Very, very touching, very powerful. And Ron, one of the things that Maddie does so well in her book is she excavates some of your backstory, which I actually knew very, very little about. But and when you came here to deliver that tape, which was so kind of you to drive down last week to, to do so, you were just mentioned to me casually just outside this, this room, you know, we were talking about, you know, girl sports, and you just said, you know, I was raised by my mom and my sister, you know, got married, had two daughters. It's just, it's just what I've known. How would you characterize, as far as you can tell, the difference in terms of coaching a girls' high school team versus a boys' high school team? What's, that, what's the experience? How is that different? Um, yeah, I've done both. I was boys' Hopkins coach at varsity level for six years, and then I did the Amherst girls for 21 years and did college men and college women. I was the assistant at Amherst College uh, women's team. So uh, there are differences. Sorry to say, there are differences. Um, most of them are positive. Um, I found that the young women that I coached um, were open to listen. They were open to try new things. And I found with the guys, I did mostly unteaching. They came with a portfolio of a, a basketball game, most of which wasn't very productive, and had to reteach skills and convince people to play roles on teams. And um, frankly, I spent most of my time as a boys coach getting their attention. And I ended up being a person that I didn't know who I was. I, ha I was actually old school. And uh, I didn't like myself as that coach, and so I decided to move jobs, and I decided I wasn't going to coach again. Um, so anyway, I, I was an old school coach. I, my name at Hopkins Academy was Gonzo. Why was I Coach Gonzo? Um, I had a group of guys who were just incredibly infuriating, and I had had about enough. So I dragged them out of the gym and put them in a, a side room. They call it the training room. And I closed the door, and I told them everything I thought about them. And I said, you guys are going to play as a team. You're going to follow my direction. You're going to do what I want you to do. And if you don't, you are going to be gonzo. And I 
took the door and I slammed it and when I went outside, I punched it. I didn't know it was a solid wood door. Oh God. And my knuckles have never been the same ever since. And I waited in the gym and about 20 minutes later they came bedraggling out and then we finally had some success there. Um, but I found that the young women who were very smart uh, knew to listen to me and they actually had the presence of mind to try the skills that we did in practice in games. And I realized from them that the more that we had, that I put them in situations where it was a game situation, that they got better and better and better. So I, I threw away the drills, I threw away the old Coach Gonzo, and I just kind of became more of, I felt in some ways, an advisor and uh, a, a cheerleader and showed them the right way and just, well, I turned from a negative coach to a positive coach. And I figured we got more out of stopping practice and rather than yelling at somebody, I would stop practice whenever the right thing happened. I said, whoop, that's it, stop, freeze. Do you see just what she did? And then, why was it right? Why did it work? Let's keep doing that. And I, t I, I was able to turn my coaching around and I think that was a big part of the, the, the change. And I just, one more thing, we were 20 years after Title IX. I think Title IX, it's kind of hypothetical, but it, but it said we should give young women and girls a chance. That's what it was saying. And 20 years later, this group showed them what women are capable of doing. And they did most of it, a lot of it on their own, and they did it collaborating themselves. And there's no last shot at Midville High to win the game. We won that tournament, game. that championship game was won in the warm-up drill. But when we, I think 20 years after Title IX, this was what could happen if women were given the chance. And so I think we're happy to be part of that. Terrific, terrific answer. Um, a lot of what seemed to make that team go was this incredible sense of trust that you all had in each other, that you had in Ron, that he had in you. And then I want to also extend this over to Maddie because when you are, want to write serious nonfiction and you want to write a story that is not just about a team winning a championship and what the scores of the games are, but to really plunge into these real stories to, to encounter adolescent girls and some of the anguish, some of the difficulty, some of the strains, some of the insecurities, and to really get people to embrace their communication with you, to trust you, to excavate that type of terrain. What was it like for you as you began, once you had made this decision to go for this New York Times Sunday Magazine story and then the book, what was it like cultivating that level of relationship with these young women? Um, I did have a, a secret strategy, food. Young athletes are always hungry. And so um, that was part one of the strategy. Part two was to divide and conquer. Even though they were a team, I tried to, or I did interview all of them individually and sometimes in, in pairs and in certain dyads, so to speak. Um, I interviewed their parents. Um, but most of all, I think that the strategy I had that worked was that I treated you all like grown-ups in some senses that I would make appointments to interview you. And it became kind of, um, it was a grown-up thing to have an appointment. Maybe it was at, at the at Amherst Chinese or a, a Bart's Ice Cream, but it was a time and a place and we would meet and I'd have my notebook out and I would listen. And uh, they had a, a place to be where they were, you know, able to, to share their, their sense of the team. And they often told me things that they might not have said necessarily in a group. I still remember from Rita learning that at one point, uh, Rita's mother, when I guess she turned 15, gave her daughter a birthday party, perfectly a wonderful thing to do. Her mother had a brainstorm though. Wouldn't it be great, instead of having like a bouncy house or something, if I invited Jen and Jamila, the team captains to the party, as the entertainment? which she did, mortifying Rita, to the point that when she told me this, she said, you can't use this, you can use this, you can't. <laughs> Finally I said, you know, I think I can use this in the fullness of time, but you asked me to keep one thing out, which I did, that you and Lucia Marinus, I should also say that 
Andrew Maris's cousin was on this team, speaking of connectivity, that you used to refer to Jen as God. Oh, yeah. and, I, and she said, you cannot use that. And I actually didn't because I thought maybe that, I don't know. I, I didn't know what would happen. Of course, she went to divinity school. So you, you, you I found other God. You found another God, OK. Um, we should, uh, but but I, I, they, they, um, they liked, I think adolescents like being treated as people who are responsible human beings. And I actually like that age group. I never had that thing that some parents have that they're so afraid of their teenagers because of all the things that they did, I guess, when they were teenagers. I had a, a very restricted high school upbringing. I went to Earthline Academy in Springfield from Granby, Mass, like 20, 25 miles away. So I commuted, went to school, came home, saw cows, did homework, went to bed. I didn't know the high school could be fun, so I had no idea of all the, all the trouble you could get into as well, and how your parents were so happy that you were a part of this team because there was always the thought that the team will give you structure and purpose in life and keep you from doing some t you know, typical teenage things. Um, that, no, I just, it's interesting, this, um, the approach of taking teenagers seriously. I know that's, I know that I can speak that that's something I certainly responded to. And again, the sense of connectivity and this message from Coach about always thinking about other people in your town. So, um, yeah, 30 years later, wow. Um, I, I coach youth basketball wow. in my town. And I totally try to, uh, to take every single, you were saying every season, every team, every sport, it's possible for something amazing to happen. And this idea of taking kids really seriously in their sporting life, no matter what age they're at, that's totally something that I, you know, it's something I've taken, taken forward and I do think makes a difference for people. I was gonna say the other thing about Kristen was, um, she tried to present, you can see that it was obviously a complete failure, just a little bit. She tried to present as a badass. <laughs> and at one point, she liked to make it seem as if this, her daughter's here, don't listen or just <laughs> pretend I'm not. She tried to make it seem as if she was, you know, always out having fun. And uh, coach brought her in. And I wasn't there, but I, I, you know, I would reconstruct these conversations. Coach would say he said something, then I'd, separately ask the person he said it to and see if the, make sure the accounts jived and then I felt comfortable using them in the book. But if I understand correctly, coach said, you know, this is gonna be a really serious year. You know, this, uh, the, you know, what is it, November? What was it right after Thanksgiving, the official season starts? I want you to be there and be square. And, and Kristen said, don't worry, coach. All my friends know I can't party till after March. And that was not the answer she was looking for, but it was the answer she, she felt comfortable giving. Uh, and in fact, I, I, I later talked to Chris, Kristen about this. It turned out she was a straight A student. She was really about as, uh, I don't know, towing the line as anybody can get. But you did like to make it seem as if you were gonna, um, I don't know, take over the world in, in a really unusual way. Coach used to say, she, in the yearbook, it shouldn't say, under Kristen's name, it shouldn't say most likely to succeed. It should just say most likely to. <laughs> so so uh, we have about 10 minutes. I'm going to ask one more question and then open it up to the audience. And my, my last question is this. So we are approaching, this will be, as I said, the 30th anniversary of that team. That's a while back now. So time marches on. Uh, you know, I vividly remember that state championship game that we saw a little clip of it. I remember your teammate Kathleen Poe saying to me at the end of that game is one of my favorite quotes from a high school athlete. She said at the end of that, she said, this is the best experience of my whole entire life thus far. <laughs> I love that quote. And so uh, I'm curious, uh, not necessarily where this ranks for you, whether you would consider this the best experience of your whole entire life thus far, but as you look back uh, across the vista of time, three decades almost, how does this experience live for you? How, how has it impacted your lives? Uh, it's the people who are the players, the coach, the writer who chronicled this. The reality of this team, this season, this story, how has it influenced the person that you have become? Easy question. I was already pretty cool, so <laughs> didn't really affect me all that much. 
I do want to tell you one quick thing. I was a principal of Amherst Junior High, and my co-principal was out that day, and I was in early stuffing mailboxes with an important bulletin for that day the teachers needed to know. And I'm stuffing the mailboxes, and all of a sudden I get a hug from behind. Somebody's hugging me. I'm like, hello, you know, good morning. And I turn around. It was an English teacher, Joyce Skipton. And she said, I just had to give you a hug. I said, well, thanks, but why? She said, I just finished reading the book, and I can't believe your childhood. Your childhood was horrible. And I said, Joy, look at me. I made it. Let's not worry about the childhood anymore. Here, I'll give you another <laughs> hug and get to homeroom. So that's how it affected me. I was going to say one thing uh, about the, the final game and the uh, wonderful quotes. I remember Kathleen actually really melting down. She want, wrote a big poem about how she wanted to melt into the gymnasium floor forever or something because she was so, you know. But, but I remember the, the girls were all in the locker room and uh, the game was over. They had won. It was wonderful. It was actually Kristen's birthday. They'd sung to her on the floor. But they wouldn't leave the locker room. They just kept lunging at each other, hugging, crying, and coaches saying, you know, he was trying to say there's no, what was it, no tears in baseball? He was trying to say, hey, there's no tears in basketball. He tried, didn't work. Uh, and finally he said, okay, he put up his hand. He said, I have to tell you something right now, and it's really, really important. And they did, you know, okay, you know, they listened a little bit. <laughs> they calmed down, and he said, there will be lots more basketball. And that was one of my favorite lines of the entire season because they looked at him in disbelief and said, but no, it's over. You know, they're going to college. We're never going to get to play again. He said, you don't understand. This is one, one team, one moment, one victory. You're going to have many more victories like this. They may not actually involve basketball, but this basically without being this ornate about it, he was saying this is the template for what will happen in the future if you let it be, this kind of success. Just think about that and try to make your lives, lead your lives in such a way that these wonderful moments happen. And I think knowing Coach Moyer, that eventually you become the kind of people who create them for others. Is that right? And last word from the two players about how it sits for you after all this time. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it had a pretty long-term continual impact on me, both in my sense of possibility, again, on kind of the Title IX front, and the sense of just my possibility of being um, a woman and a leader in my community, wherever I was. Um, that feels really significant. Also, much more concretely, I went to college, and I, um, I tore my ACL, so I didn't get to play college basketball. I tore it right away, and I felt like my whole life was ruined, and I, and I, I didn't really know why. Um, and so I began to study basketball, and this is actually where I started studying religion. So now I'm, I'm an Episcopal priest. I'm a chaplain at Harvard. That's my current role. And it started because I started really thinking about what had happened to us <laughs> and what were the different elements of community and ritual and transcendence and all these things that I realized were normally in the category of religion. I suddenly realized were happening in the category of sports. So that's what I spent my undergraduate year studying and kind of pursued that in different ways up until the present day. Um, so it has had a huge, and as I said, I'm a, I'm a very proud youth basketball coach. <laughs> and so it's had huge effects on me. Well, that's tough to follow. <laughs> um, I, I, I think number one, you were just talking about this, Maddie, this, this template that we now had of what great is in terms of, for me, team, and um, the idea of embracing and pursuing winning in a way that is um, graceful, maybe? I, I, you know, I think there, it, on the youth sports side of things, sometimes there's such debate about how much emphasis you put on winning, and we've gone back and forth with the trophy, you know, generations and that whole thing. And, I think that the confidence and the empowerment and even the maturity that you gain from losing gracefully as well as winning gracefully is so important. And our kids have to learn how to do that because it's exactly how real life is going to work when they're adults. And if no one teaches you how to do that, how do you have a template for how to perform in the working world? Um, and so 
we learned that and coach taught us how to do both, lose and win gracefully. Um, and the experience of what it's like to be on a real team where people really do commit to each other and to the, the, the concept and of the, that greater good of that unit um, is something that I have brought into my professional life and tried to recreate and have recreated. Also, you know when it's hollow and it's not there um, and when to avoid it. Um, and then to carry the lessons that we've learned from the experience and, you know, to a great deal from coach to our families and to our children. I've coached, I coached CYO for my daughter for, for many years, um, who's here, and um, try and teach the next generation the same thing so that those lessons do pass down. Because I would say um, it's a, still a small percentage of coaches who actually know how to teach positively and to emphasize the right things. Um, so it, it needs to spread. Well, I was going to kick it to the audience, but I think there's no better note to end on this template of what great is. I love that phrase. And it, it was, it was so clear at the time that it was that it was, I remember how astonishing it was, uh, you know, half my lifetime ago, being around this team a little bit and just coming back from talking to some of these young women and just thinking, oh my goodness, they're just so eloquent, so thoughtful, there's just something remarkable that is happening here. And, uh, you know, I think we see that 30 years later. I mean, this is just such a beautiful evocation of a remarkable team, a remarkable time. It's wonderful that it is eternalized in this glorious book that Maddie has, has written. Uh, I strongly encourage people to pick it up, to read it, to reread it. It's available out in the hallway. They will be there to meet you, greet you, sign some books. I just want to thank all of you for just such a powerful, powerful panel. It's been great. Um, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you. What a wonderful morning we've had. Uh, just so, so good. Um, and the day just continues to, uh, to be better and better. Um, this next session uh, we have, it's called Legends. Uh, Legends after lunch. Uh, it was Legends at lunch, but then we thought you would think you were getting fed and you're not. Uh, so Legends after lunch. So I want to introduce our, our panel. Uh, I have a couple of videos that I'm going to share as I introduce. Uh, so let's go ahead and get underway of Title IX Celebration, the History of Women's Basketball, 9-9. Tina Thompson is, simply put, one of the all-time greatest women's basketball players, a member of both the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame and the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame just down the road. Thompson was the very first draft pick in the history of the WNBA. She helped to lead the Houston Comets to a remarkable string of four straight WNBA titles when the league began. She is a nine-time, nine-time WNBA All-Star and two-time Olympic gold medalist. She retired as the WNBA's all-time leading scorer and now sits second on the list behind only Diana Taurasi. Thompson from the University of Southern California. <laughs> 
<laughs> I was so young, but so proud that I'm just part of the, the building stages. Even then, I thought I would only play for a few years, you know, 17 years later, like, I mean, it's still kind of pretty amazing to me. chemistry was very obvious in the beginning. It was really cool because no one knew that we were as good as we were except for us. I think in that first year we weren't even picked to make it to the playoffs. So considering that and then, you know, winning four championships in a row, it was really cool. I mean, we kind of like stuck into some people early on. fondest for me is our third championship. I mean, not to take anything away from the first and second, but that season for us was very difficult. Kemper Rod, who was my teammate as well as one of my close friends, she was going through a struggle for her life, and it was just a really emotional and trying time. Last Thursday, Kim Rod lost her battle with cancer. The Comets have dedicated their season to Kim. I try not to think about it because even now you get like very emotional just because you know the person that she was and for me that was the proudest because we won but um also the toughest. Tina Thompson. Just behind Thompson at number three on the WNBA all-time scoring list is legendary Tamika Catchings. Playing her entire 15-year career with the Indiana Fever, Catchings was the WNBA champion, a league MVP, and a finalist MVP. She was the winner and a winner at every level helping to spark Tennessee to an NCAA championship and playing on four Olympic gold medal winning teams. She served as the president of the WNBA Players Association and she was a slam dunk conductee in both the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame and the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame. <laughs> And we'll go to the next one. Maybe. Tamika Catchings, perhaps the most revered player in WNBA history. She does everything, plays with such muscle and heart. She's just an icon for winning basketball. Catchings for the win! Tamika Catchings developed her drive and determination to succeed during her childhood when she learned how to cope with hearing impairment in both ears. Tamika, how you doing? Her will and resolve would become legendary at the University of Tennessee. One of my heroes, Coach Summit, 
she spoke so highly of Tamika catching. So when I got to Tennessee, everything was like catch goes 110 percent. Catchings would become an NCAA champion, and then it was on to the WNBA, where she led the Indiana Fever to the playoffs 13 of her 15 seasons with the team. What well, catches with a nice spin move and finish. As she continued her pursuit of a WNBA title, she also built her resume on the world stage as a mainstay of the U.S. national team. She played with a level of intensity and grit that was not comparable to any other player in the league. It was something that you could expect without a doubt. After winning Olympic golds in 2004 and 2008, her star continued to rise in the WNBA when she won the league's highest honor. 2004, WNBA, and a year later, she became a finals MVP, leading the fever into the history books. Catchings was a 10-time All-Star a five-time Defensive Player of the Year, is the WNBA's all-time leader in steals, and won a total of four Olympic gold medals. She did so much. And this is someone who, year in and year out, was leading her team in everything. Points, rebounds, assists, steals, you name it. So it's really rare to see that player, your star player, be the same player that's taking the charge, that's diving on those balls. Stripped from behind by catch, it's out of bounds, it's Indiana ball! Catch was a giver. She was the best teammate anyone can ask for. Her presence on the floor is unmatched. Tamika Catching. We also have two additional legends. There are legends. <laughs> Former superstar, longtime successful coach, and longtime baller Naomi Graves is a well suited is well suited to co-moderate this illustrious panel. Naomi grew up in Western Massachusetts. In the mid '70s, the dawn of Title IX, she became a local legend, leading Hampshire Regional High School to four straight state champions chips. She went on to the University of Rhode Island and became the all-time leading scorer. And at Springfield College, the birthplace of basketball, she has brought women's basketball to a new level. Entering her 32nd year as our head coach, she has won over 500 games, including 24 a year ago, when her team made it all the way to the Sweet 16. Naomi Graves. Coach, the highlight video was too long to play today, so we will make sure that we get that, you know, edited down. Last but certainly not least, Marty Dalbro. Marty has been a professor of communication sport journalism at Springfield College since 1999. A national award-winning journalist, he is the author of a book on college basketball and another one on minor league baseball. He has great interest in civil rights and social justice and has written in-depth stories on these topics in publications like the, Wal the Washington Post and The Atlantic. Along with recent Springfield College graduate Chris Rim, Marty is the host of Liberty, Justice, and Ball, a podcast sponsored by the Naismith Memorial Hall of Fame. Among the recent episodes are interviews with a couple people you just met, Tina Thompson and Tamika Catchings. Marty, would you go ahead and start us off? Naomi's going to start us off, but I will say, just say this, that uh, this is an interesting vantage point to be sitting for watching those films. I couldn't see them as it's back here. I had, I had seen them. I had sent them over to Sue. But it gave me a kind of unique landscape because I was just, you know, I couldn't see. And so I was looking over and I see Tamika watching Tina's video and her face was just so luminous. She was just loving all this stuff about Tina and it, it was just filled with so much pride and happiness. And Tina sat through it fairly impassively and then the 
script flipped and they did the one on Tamika and it was the exact opposite. So Tamika was just sitting there and Tina was just resplendent with the joy of watching her good friend and sort of celebrating her success. So that was really cool. And then also, because I couldn't see this, I looked out and watched all of you watching those videos and to just sense how the room was just riveted and so welcoming and so excited about welcoming Tamika and Tina to this room. So this is going to be pretty great. I know that old saying about how you're judged by the company you keep. I'm feeling pretty good about that right now. I'm feeling really, really good about it now. And we're going to have a conversation here over the, about the next 45 minutes, and I'm going to kick it over to Naomi Graves to get things started. Yeah, thanks, Marty. I, um, I just have to say I'm pinching myself. Um, two passions, basketball and Title IX. What an amazing morning we've had, and now I'm sitting up here with these legends, and again, I'm looking at what you saw, them smiling at each other like they're teammates, and I'm thinking, man, I am in heaven. This, I don't want to wake up. And then the room being full, the impact that you're going to have after this session is going to amaze you as you walk out the door. Hopefully, you'll stay. But um, I came here a long time ago, and I said to people, birthplace of basketball, men's basketball, I'm going to put women on the map, and I'm sitting here, and we're celebrating you two and women's basketball and educating our community on women's basketball. I'm pretty excited. So uh, this is a question that both of you are going to have a chance to answer, but I'm going to kind of set the scenario so you can turn and, and tell people about your background. I grew up in a small community in western Massachusetts, not a lot of women playing ball. Played mostly with men, not a lot of facilities. Came out of there loving the game. Luckily enough, I'm still loving the game. I want to hear about how you both started and what your growth pattern in the game of women's basketball has been and, and who you are today because of that. So let's start with you, Tamika. Can you give us some background about your upbringing with the game and the people who influenced you and how it all started? And then, Tina, we're going to ask you to do the same thing. So can, I, can I flip the script and have Tina go first? You can flip because any Tina's script you want, girl. The, Tina's my big sister, so I all right. only let my so big sister. So you should have told me that before, but anytime you want to flip the script, I'm good. OK, Tina, you start it off. She always does that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm uh, originally from Los Angeles, California, where I grew up, born and raised. Um, and, well, it's kind of says, it's kind of weird to say a small community because Los Angeles is such a good place. But I did have a very small kind of community, I guess my village in a sense. And um, I played at a recreation center, maybe five to seven blocks from where I grew up. And it's where I spent most or all of my time. I actually started playing basketball because uh, I thought my older brother was really, really cool. And um, he wouldn't allow me to hang out with uh, he and his friends. So I told my mom that I wanted to play basketball simply so he, she would make um, him allow me to kind of tag along. When I got to our rec center, I quickly realized the intensity and the seriousness that they had that I wasn't ready for. Um, they challenged me. You know, my mom had bought me all the gear. I kind of looked like one of those people at the park that couldn't play because <laughs> I was overly accessorized. Um, <laughs> But I was challenged by my brother and his friends because uh, a couple of them actually approached me and said, like, this isn't for girls. So that was my first experience of someone telling me, someone that I knew well, I had grew up with these guys, that you know this wasn't a place for me. And that kind of triggered something in me. Uh, at that moment, I became a basketball player. I didn't know the kind of basketball player I was going to be, but I was challenged in a way that I didn't appreciate. So um, those guys, at the time, I thought that our little rec center gym was so luxurious. Looking back on it now, it absolutely wasn't, but it was the inside place where everybody played and it was a coveted space because so many talented basketball players had come from my recreation center. So I was um, kind of banned and you know put outside on you know the cement courts with the metal backboards and the chain link nets. At the time, I didn't know uh, the difficulty of learning how to shoot on those you know double rims, but it gave me an accuracy eventually that they didn't have. So as I grew 
and as I got better, um, an opportunity came where um, I was allowed to play kind of our elders uh, in our recreation center because when I say it was a community, it really was. Um, they would give me pointers here and there, but I got an opportunity to play because there weren't enough people to play. And um, I had gotten better, like a lot better over you know the next two summers. And my brother and his friends very surprised at how much you know I had grown in such a short period of time, challenging a lot of them. In that moment, I kind of knew that I arrived, and it was just my way. You know, after that, it was something that um, I fell in love with. I felt accomplished, and I knew that it was something that I could do. Now, all of those guys are my fans and avid supporters. <laughs> but it was, I, I guess, the initial re uh, rejection that um, kind of just lit something in me. And um, I came very spirited about the sport. Now I, I could Im imagine my life, you know, without it. Um, I then went on to stay home. I got a scholarship to go to the University of Southern California, fight on. Um, where um, I played and had an incredible experience. It was actually my first real experience with Title IX. We'll get into that, you know, a little later. But um, I learned so much about who I was as a person, you know, not just a basketball player. Um, I, I will say that I think that it's something that you all, because I see a lot of young people in here are experiencing right now. I would want to challenge you all to take advantage of all the opportunities and the people that you have surrounding you. It was something that was embedded in me really, really early from our athletic director, who at the time was my mentor, that there were so many resources in everywhere you turn, every door that you pass, there's a person that has an opportunity, a story, or something that touch that can touch you in a way that will help you like as you move through this experience. Once you leave, you can't come back. So like don't miss the moments in times where you can be touched or you can touch other people because it's an experience that you can't uh, recreate. And I'm very lucky at the age of 47 today that I took advantage of those opportunities because it truly shapes who you are or who you will become. Wow, it's great stuff. Uh, my story is a little bit different. My, uh, my father actually played in the NBA, he played for 11 years. Uh, played for the Milwaukee Bucks, New Jersey Nets, Philadelphia 76ers, and the Los Angeles Clippers. And so I remember as a little girl, just, I mean, we got toted around. I'm, I'm the baby of three, so I have an older brother, middle sister, and myself. And between the three of us, we just went everywhere my dad was. And we'd be in the gym, but we'd be up at the top, you know, running through. We were those kids that you see on the sideline running, and just like the gym was our domain. Uh, but when we came, so when he finished playing in America, we moved overseas, we played in, he played in Italy for a year, and then we came back to the States after that, I remember I was in second grade. My first sport, organized sport, was soccer, then softball, and then I started playing basketball my, when I was in third grade. And, you know, I, I am so thankful because my parents put us in so many different sports. I did gymnastics, I was terrible. Tennis, not so good. Pretty much any sport, we, except for hockey, would be the only one that we didn't really do. But every other sport we did. And in seventh grade was when I fell in love with basketball. Kind of the same story as Tina, though. My goal in seventh grade was I was going to follow my dad's footsteps, and I was going to the NBA. And I remember the same boys that I would go to the park, tomboy, by far. Like, I, I was anywhere, anything, anywhere the boys went and anything the boys did, I was going to do, and I was part of that crew. But I remember telling them, I'm gonna be in the NBA just like you guys, and getting laughed at. And my fire, I mean, I think the determination from first being told because I wear hearing aids, because I have a speech impediment, that I wouldn't amount to anything, that's where sports came in for me. But then having a goal and setting that goal in basketball, becoming what I wanted, and then the friend that I had telling me that I wouldn't be able to make it to the NBA, well, the story had been written, and you know, I think that one of the things, you know, just learning from those experiences and having Title IX, having the opportunity to go to college and play for Pat Summit at the University of Tennessee. My freshman year in college was actually the first year 
of the WNBA, and Tina was the first person that got drafted. And I just remember saying to myself, all right, my goal switch from wanting to be in the NBA to the WNBA. And I was so thankful that the league came in 97, my first year, because I said, you know, they got four years to get this league, to get everything right, <laughs> get all the kinks, all the things that could, get bad, or could go bad, get it done, get it fixed, and then here we come, our class. And, you know, I'm just so grateful for the people that were on the panel before earlier today and all the people that have been here. You know, obviously, Mr. James Nays Naismith, somebody said James. I'm like, well, we got on a first-name basis real fast. <laughs> Mr. Naismith, but just the opportunity that we all have and, you know, for the women that have come before the, to be able to do what we do. And I love, I love the game of basketball and I just love the opportunities that have come from it. Great stuff. Uh, Hope you are all loving this as much as I am. This is just great. Uh, obviously, we are launching our celebration of 50 years of Title IX today. There's a lot of elements to the law. Uh, the one that we celebrate today is about gender equity in sports. And I wonder if you could each reflect, since the time that you were in college, as many of our audience is in college right now, where have you seen the greatest gains in gender equity and where is there progress that is, is still to be made? I'd say the number of young people, young women that are playing. And, you know, I don't have, like, I'm not one of those statistic gurus that just walks around with all these numbers, but the opportunity that we have, not just specific to basketball, but just across the board, has definitely grown. And, you know, I think even looking at the WNBA, we're celebrating 26 years this year, but all of the girls, all of the young women that are performing and that are in the finals, which I hope you're watching, Connecticut made it, so you guys should definitely be watching. Uh, I mean, both teams are going to have their hands full between Connecticut and Las Vegas, but I think even when you look at those young women, they grew up having the WNBA to look up to. My generation did not. Her generation did not. Your generation did not. And a lot of people, older people in this room, did not have those opportunities. And so I think really, you know, and it's not just about having the opportunity. Now it's about stepping into that. And, you know, we need more women coaches. We need more female coaches. No offense to the men. I love you guys. Really appreciate y'all and what you do. And we need you as advocate. But we also need more women as coaches to step into those roles. So I think that's really important. I agree with Tamika. Um, I grew up in a neighborhood where I was one of two girls that actually like played sports, that played basketball at my recreation center. I was one, the one that was actually serious about playing. Um, so to now see so many little girls, not just playing basketball, but playing tons of sports in general, and it be supported by the, the people that they can touch, you know, by their parents, by, you know, their teachers, by, you know, the people in their community. So it's something that they're comf not just uh, comfortable in, but they're confident in being able to find success. If you see what's going on in women's tennis, if you see what's going on and women's soccer and the impact that they're having on the world, you know, not just little girls, but little boys as well. The WNBA has had the opportunity to be able to do that. When you go to WNBA games and you look into the stands, you see little boys like with their mom or with their dad. That um, is amazing to see. I think that Title IX, I know that Title IX has had an a big impact on that and the education on in um, is an area that I think that we for sure need to grow in. Um, a lot of people view Title IX as taking an opportunity away from boys or men and giving it to women, and it is not that. It's just creating um, an equal foundation or just landscape to allow little girls to have the same opportunity. It's not taking um, anything away. It's in addition to. Wow, those are good things. I mean, Title IX, and you know, anybody who has me in class or has played for me recognizes that I had to wait in line to play. And that, like, I'm, this is feeling like a generational chip, but um, Ann Myers was here this morning, and so was Julianne, and they were talking about 
um, just the, the plight of their roles and what they fought for, and to hear you both have these opportunities but still see wanting more opportunities is so refreshing because you are that generation that's going to keep their interest, you know, get out and get more. I mean, Title IX is an impactful legislation for a lot of reasons, and we need men and women to be on board. We need everybody. It's not, a, it's not gender, just women. We need everybody, and it's important. So I'm, I've been coaching here for a while and been coaching in general, and I, I love coaching. I love the game. I love what I do with my team and my players and our community. You know, I strive to be a role model. I strive to mentor a lot of young coaches. I wonder if you could just talk about the people in your lives that have allowed you to become who you are, that those coaches that have impacted you, because we've got a lot of people out here that want to work with young people. We've got a lot of people out here who want to work with kids. You know, who mentored you? Who, how are your coaches making you become so confident and skillful and so positive and like, let's go, right? Who, who are those people in your lives? Um, I had several. I am definitely a product of a village. You know, it started at my uh, recreation center and just the elders in my rec at my recreation center, the, the older guys that, you know, not just played there, but were also working, you know, with the boys in my community. I would say that my older brother, like, he was a big influence. He was probably the person that challenged me the most. Um, we were very competitive. Like, as young people, we competed in everything between coloring in between the lines or handwriting. When I tell you the intensity of competition in my house, like, it was really serious. But, you know, it shaped my mentality, you know, in a way that at the time, as a young person, I had no idea. And as I continued, you know, through sport or through school, you know, I was touched by a lot of people. Um, my, uh, the coach that I actually committed to at Southern Cal is Mary Ann Stanley. She's actually going into the Naismith Hall of yes. Fame this year. Um, so extremely excited about that. Um, I have been privileged to have not just good coaches, but very good people. Although I didn't play for Marianne Stanley because there was like a Title IX circumstance during her contractual, contractual year, that was my freshman year. Um, we stayed in contact, you know, and she's kind of like mentored me and just continued to touch me like throughout my career and stay in contact with her. I absolutely love her. She's had an incredible impact on the game, but I believe that that's what it takes. And I could say that for all of my coaches. I um, lost Marianne Stanley, but um, was lucky to get Cheryl Miller, who I think is the best basketball player ever. She is my GOAT. Um, to coach me, you know, um, during my first couple years at Southern Cal, and um, I could just go down the line. I just think that God has really had his hand, you know, placed on me and guiding me, not just to, you know, to give me, I guess, the gifts that I had for me to be able to cultivate, but to um, put people in place in my life throughout my journey and give me, um, I guess the intellect or uh, ability to listen and learn, you know, from these incredible people. So coaches, teachers, professors, mentors, counselors, they're all very important people. And I just hope that if you're in that position that you covet that space and that you um, treat it with a, a, a delicate, hand because of the influence and the impact that you can possibly have positively and negatively. So um, in knowing your role and your, your impact, it's really important because I um, am just so grateful for, for those that have touched me to allow me or guide me, you know, in the way to be able to sit here in front of you guys because it definitely did have a great impact on who I am as a person. I would say, I mean, kind of the same, just had a lot of people through my journey, and it started with my parents, like so many of us, you know, our parents and my brother and my sister, just having them, because of my, my hearing impairment, because of my speech impediment, I didn't talk to people, and so that was my crew. My brother, my sister, and I, we were a pack. We went everywhere together, and even throughout the journey, I think about coaches. I think about teachers, and teachers that 
help me, guide me. You know, I, I couldn't, I had to sit in the front row. There were times when I had to talk to the teacher after class, but being able to get the right information. So, you know, I think that, and then going along, just coaches along the way. Pat is a big influence on my life, I'm sure. For those of you guys, you know, your coaches that you have, but she was a huge influence on just, she wanted us to be the best. The best in the classroom, the best on, on the basketball court, the best in the community. But overall, when we left the University of Tennessee, she wanted us to be the best people. And she wanted us to have an impact on our, li on our own lives, but on the people that were around us. And I think having someone like her as a coach and watching her as our coach, as a mother to Tyler, in the community, I mean, I remember showing up places, getting off the plane, and people would just be like, Google eyes over Pat Summit just coming down. And you know, she would always wave, she'd always talk to people. She always made people feel like you were the only person that mattered in that moment. And for that split second, people just kind of, and I, I remember just watching her and saying, I wanna have that type of impact on people. I wanna be like that. I don't care about roles, title, who you are, what, you know, your accomplishment, great, not to take it away, not to take my own accomplishments away, but at the own, end of the day, I think my question would be, which pant leg do you put on first? Do you do your left? Do you do your right? What about your socks? And I think kind of bringing everybody down to the level of, I just want to interact. I love people, I love relationships, and a lot of that is because of her and just watching her work rooms and watching her just evolve and be who she was. I actually want to follow up a little bit about Pat. Uh, I think, you know, we're now, she's been gone for a while now, and some of our current students may not be as familiar with Pat Summit, who was one who of the- Who doesn't know Pat Summit? I mean, you should all Raise know Pat. Raise your hand if you're going to get you. I'm going to tell you, she's going to find I'm you. I heard that in that <laughs> voice. <laughs> I mean, Pat was, I mean, one of the all-time, all-time, all-time coaches, and always will be. And uh, as Tamika says, was, you know, incredibly demanding, expected excellence in absolutely everything, and had this, this reputation. We talked about it a little bit over lunch. Andrew Marinus was reflecting to our lunch group about how tough she seemed to be to everyone, and he was even a little intimidated watching her on television. And when I spoke with you, Tamika, with, with Chris on our podcast, we asked a little bit about this, and you referenced, since it's come up a couple times already in your comments about your hearing impediment, you know, your hearing impairment, your speech impediment, the story of Pat's influence on that, and how you had, as a young child, the frustration had, had resulted in your de decision to take out your, your hearing aids, and how Pat got you to change that. Could you, could you share that story with the audience? I think it's a really powerful one. I didn't necessarily take out my hearing aids, I threw out my hearing aids. <laughs> when I was in, uh, yeah, when I was in second grade, when we, or when I was in third grade, when we moved back to, the, to America, second grade, uh, we moved down to Abilene, Texas, and I, one day, like for me, one of the things that I wanted to do, which I'm sure all of us have had struggles to some extent, I wanted to be normal, whatever that is. I wanted to fit in, whatever that was, and I remember one day just throwing my hearing aids out. Um, my mom was not happy. We won't talk about that right now because that wasn't the question. <laughs> but I wanted to start there because I went from second grade. So when I talk about teachers and people that have been in my life, I went from second grade all the way to my freshman year in college without wearing my hearing aids. And one day after practice, how many of you guys love practice? <laughs> all I'm right. watching my players right now. That wasn't quick enough. How many of y'all love practice? <laughs> there we go. Thank you. I know not everybody's an athlete, and I know we got professors and coaches and all that. I love practice. But anyway, one day after practice, Pat said, uh, hey, I, I want to I wanna talk to you after practice. And my mind like, went through a quick little spiral because I'm like, what did I do wrong? A, whenever the coach comes at you and says, I want to talk to you after practice, their first mind is like, oh, crap. Like, what did I do? And so I'm thinking, and she's like, when you get done with your workout, when you get done, get, get your shots up, and then, you know, I want to see you in the locker room. And finished my shots, but still thinking, and I'm, I remember it's like the long hallway that you just see in like the never-ending hallway, kind of like at the MGM Springfield, like, like a never-ending hallway. And I get to the locker room, Pat's in there, our trainers. Where's my trainers at? Where are the trainers? Shout out to the trainers. So 
trainer Pat sitting there on the uh, table and I walk in and I'm like, okay, something's wrong. And Pat just started talking. She said, hey, um, had a conversation with your mom. I'm like, why did you call my mom? <laughs> well, whatever, you don't say that to Pat. Um, so she's like, I had a conversation with your mom and I found out that you were born with a hearing disability. I'm like, okay. I'm like, you know, and so she then started going through a series of questions. She said, you know, if people can't see, what do they need? Like, they need glasses, contacts. I wear both, so I know. She said, when people walk with a limp, what do they use? And I said, well, some use canes, some use walkers, some. She went through a series of questions, and then the last question she asked was when people can't hear. And in that moment when she was saying the question, I almost like, how did I even get in this conversation? If people can't hear, what do they need? And I said, hearing aids. And she said, one day your story will impact thousands, maybe millions of people. So I, we, recommend that you get back into wearing your hearing aids. And I will say this, y'all. I know the last panel talked about using your voice and using your platform. I did not have a voice. Basketball was my voice. I didn't talk to people. I definitely didn't do this. I would do basketball camps. I would do like stuff that I could be around. But as far as talking, I did not talk. And so when Pat said, one day your story will impact thousands, maybe millions of people, I said, she doesn't know who I am. <laughs> but I got back in the way of my hearing aids. And you know, it's been obviously a blessing to be able to share my story. And there are a lot of us, a lot of us where there's something different. Like I, my faith is a big part, Tina as well. My faith is a big part of who I am. And every single one of us is uniquely made the way that we're made for a specific reason, for a specific purpose on this, on this world, on this planet. And I think for Pat, you know, like she knew that my voice would one day be important and that beyond basketball and beyond what we're capable of doing. And I'm just, now I'm, I'm finally stepping into that. Now I shouldn't say finally. I, from that day forward, I stepped into it and it's been a blessing. So here we are. Well. Pat was so right. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that are just eyes on you, little eyes on you, right? Watching what you went through, and that story just brings it to life. Um, quick thing with, with Marianne Stanley and Pat, young coach, WBCA, Women's Basketball Coaches Association. Start, I was in the early phases of it when we were all in one room around the tables, and those women coaches sat at my table and mentored me. They were all about bringing, up, bringing us along just like you are, bringing kids along, bringing the young pups along, um, and, and fighting for the rights of equality, of being recognized, of having their sport and their players, and um, just listening to the two of you, it, it, it's impactful. Like hearing the people that really are still in your lives and the mentors, it's really impactful. We're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about the WNBA um, and, and the season a little bit. We're in the middle of the playoffs. Um, you are each considered, you know, the all-time greats in that particular area, the WNBA. How do you assess the league now, overall? How do you assess where we are in, in the WNBA for women? I think that we're in a very good place. Um, the, the fact that um, we, I, I remember when I started, um, Tamika not long after that, um, I believe also when Tamika um, came to the WNBA, we were actually paying television to broadcast our game. So the WNBA, the networks that were broadcasting our game were actually vendors of the WNBA. So we had to pay them to put us on television. Um, we're long ways from there because now um, ESPN, NBA TV, and other networks are actually paying the WNBA to, um, to broadcast our games, which means that we've kind of stepped into, you know, the next level as far as professional sports where um, there is a want, there is a need, um, 
and people want to see the WNBA like on television. Um, we are constantly a, uh, a constant work in progress in a sense that we are 26 years young. Um, at the same point, very similar with the NBA. You guys are very privileged to see the NBA in a different way as a global brand. But at this time, I was a young person and the NBA didn't look like necessarily the WNBA, but it was in a similar place. And the fact that it wasn't um, a global brand and finance was still, you know, a concern. You know, players weren't being paid a hundred million dollars, you know, you know, at a time. Um, I remember being a, I believe it was a junior in high school, and um, Magic Johnson, who was my favorite player, had signed a 10-year um, one million dollar a year contract so he signed a contract this is magic johnson the greatest point guard of all time signed a contract for 10 million dollars and people were passing out um in today's game there are players that don't see the floor that make 10 million dollars a year so Yes, they've definitely come a long way, but the WNBA is still growing. I remember in that inaugural season, people were questioning whether we would get through that season or get to five years. So um, being able to say um, 26 years in, I'm very proud of the WNBA and to be an alumni of the WNBA, I am extremely proud of the young women that are continuing to grow their games, their skill set, the level of athleticism that is changing the game. You now consistently see female basketball players dunking comfortably. It is a normal thing to see now. It wasn't my thing. But I think it's pretty cool to actually see. I wasn't that type of athlete, but the fact that now the world is seeing our game um, in a different way, it allows us the opportunity to um, continue to grow. It is very much like Title IX. It is the responsibility of us, you know, to grow the game, not for little girls to watch the game and tune in, but also for little boys and for men to show the same support. If you have daughters, this is a game for you. Just like little girls watch the NBA and the NFL, it is a sport. And I, I promise you, if you haven't seen a game yet, if you walk into that arena or you watch a game on television, you will be hooked. Hooked. So don't do yourselves a disservice and not watch. It is a game that you would enjoy. I mean, I, I agree, you know, and when you talk about evolvement, not just the ESPN, CBS, but everybody has their phones, right? Now we're on Twitter and like all, we're, we're act more accessible, not just W, not just the W, I'd say other sports too. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things, if you don't know, our um, WNBA commissioner, Kathy Engelbert, absolutely amazing. You know, she just did a, a fund. They raised, I think, 50 billion or 50, not billion, 50 million dollars that will hopefully in the next five to 10 years evolve and help our, our league continue to grow through marketing and digital assets and a lot of other things. We've watched the news, they're hoping to add two more W teams in the next couple of years. So you start thinking about growth and I think that's really, really important. But Tina hit it on the nail, started with just as simple as being on TV and being able to have access to it is the number one thing. Cause you can't watch something if you don't have access to it. So it's the same thing. Thank you. Beyond the success uh, of the league on the court and financially, uh, and in terms of just growing the game with its fan base. I think the W has done a particularly outstanding job of embracing social justice as a kind of collective mission in the league. And I wonder if each of you could reflect a little bit on your thoughts about uh, to what degree that is something that is a, an opportunity and or a responsibility of modern players to sort of embrace the social justice side of things. 
Well, I would say that um, I know in starting in that inaugural season, um, all of the women at that time took on the responsibility and embraced the fact that we were a blue collar league, that we were the league of the people. We were an affordable game that families could come to and could support. A lot of us were experiencing the same everyday kind of struggles and experiences of the people that were coming to our game. So it is something that has been the personality of the WNBA all along. So whether it uh, be social justice or whether it be women's rights or you know the ability to choose, all of those things were experiences of the players that were in that league. So it is second nature for us to stand up, to speak about, and to fight for things that in impact the people that support us because honestly, we are those people. So it's not something that we are far removed, far removed from because we are successful and because we are visible. There are still things that we experience. We are Title IX, and Title IX is us. It's Amen. not just. Yum, <laughs> it's, I love that. It's just not um, the ability to play sports. That's one of the things that um, I think kind of gets lost in translation about um, Title IX. It is also in the workplace, in the work uh, force. You don't have to be um, an athlete to benefit from Title IX. It is something that just kind of levels the playing field for, for women in general. I am very proud of our league and the voice, the voice and the strength and just uh, um, want to kind of speak up and sacrifice because sometimes speaking up is not necessarily a positive thing for you. Sometimes there is backlash. You are sacrificing not just yourself, but um, the livelihood at your, of your families at times. And the fact that the entire league um, as a collective decided or decides on a regular basis that they're gonna risk it all and speak up for themselves or others, I think is absolutely amazing. Well, I think it's the platform that we all have. You know, you, all of us, we have an opportunity to use our voice and to stand up for things that we believe in, right? You, you have that opportunity. A lot of people choose not to for fear, for backlash, for whatever other reason, for it not being the right time. And, but to be able to have the opportunity that you have, somebody fought for that. You know, as African-American women, somebody fought for African-American even to be able to go to a school for it to be co-mingled way back when. I mean, there's so many things, athletes, Title IX, I mean, so many things that we're fighting for. You guys are the future. And I know I'm not old, but it's your generation that's going to continue to change this world. So when I think about social justice and, you know, I mean, it hasn't been that far removed, 2016, Indiana Fever, we were a team that kneeled during the national anthem. If I had to do it again, would I? Yes. Because you fight for what you believe in. And one of the things as you go along that is you fight with an action plan. So I knew even before we did that, what our action plan was gonna do. We did a big community day with some kids in the community, with our law enforcement, with coaches, with different players from different teams, and we came together and we had an opportunity to talk about what are the next steps from here. But let me be clear, by doing that, I got threatened on Twitter. I had a cop car parked outside of my house for a week because somebody came and threatened and said that they were gonna come and shoot me. But even if that does happen, you've used your voice and you use your platform. And there's so many people that have fought for so many things for us to have, so many people. You look at the history books, look at the things that aren't even in the history books. Do your own research. When you're fighting for something, why are you fighting for it? Don't fight because, oh, the person next to me wants to do it. Do your own research. Use your own voice. Use your own platform. So I am super proud of what we stand for in the WNBA. 
Because what I do know, as being former president of the Players Association, we research every single thing that we fight for. Every single topic that comes on, they have done the research. The players know what we're fighting for. They know why we're fighting for it. And if you don't believe in that, step aside. You don't have to fight for every single thing that somebody else is fighting for. If it's not your cause, it's not your cause. But I love, from the WNBA standpoint, fighting for women's rights. You know, the new law or the law getting overturned. I know you guys talked about that already in the last panel, and I can talk about it again. But if that's something that, that you don't believe in or believe in, everybody has a choice. And I think that's the beauty of the WNBA is we got 144 women that are on that team. We have 12 teams, 12 players. Not every team has 12 players, but 144 opportunities. And 144 women fighting for things that they are so passionate about. And imagine if there's something that happened to one of your family members that you want to fight for, and somebody's like, hey, no, no, sit down. You, you, don't, get that, you don't get that opportunity. Imagine how much more fire you would have to fight. That's the same thing. When we talk about racial issues, our league is predominantly African American. So fighting for race, that's my brother, that's my uncle, that's my father, that's somebody that I'm related to, that's a family friend. We fight for the things that we believe in. And each one of you has that opportunity to find something that you're passionate about and fight for it. Use your voice, use your platform, whatever that looks like, just use it. Sorry, I get passionate. Love, love, love that fire. I know a number of people have to leave for class and I'm sure you're yeah, regretting it. We gotta go it, to class but... too, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> have a great day, guys. Thanks for showing up. We're going to continue on for we have, uh, I think, another 10 minutes or so. So, Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that was a great answer about your feelings about the WNBA. And I, I think Marty's going to follow up maybe with the, the question about Brittany. Yeah, no, be I, I, be absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we had talked about that. That kind of falls into what you're just it, talking about with the league. So. It, it probably does, and I think it's, I mean, it's kind of the elephant in the room about women's basketball, obviously the situation with Brittany Griner, uh, who is sitting in a Russian jail still and has this nine year sentence and she has been a, you know, a tremendous, tremendous player and presence in this league. And it's a exceedingly delicate and difficult situation. I think that you have each had the experience, if I'm correct, of playing overseas in, in Russia for some time. And if you could talk maybe first a little bit from that perspective, what that was like. Chris Rim, who did, does the podcast with me, just did a great story with the New York Times where he went to uh, the Mercury's first game after BG was convicted and was interviewing the players. It was a really powerful story. And one of the Players. It was a game against the Sun. I think it was John Quill Jones that he was interviewing who had, was talking about what a great experience she had actually had in Russia, how welcomed, how accepted. And I thought it was a really interesting perspective. I was wondering if you could each talk about your experiences there and also just the fact of a number of women still for all these advances having to go play overseas to supplement the income. Well, I I actually think that a lot of what Tamika just said in, in the um, previous segment or um, in answering the previous question is that awareness is very important. Um, I am not just self-aware, like I'm very conscious of the things that are happening around me. Um, I don't know if it's a product of just kind of growing up in Los Angeles, California, and just kind of being aware of your surroundings and things that are um, going on um, around you. And that has like levels to it. You know, when you go to different countries, it's important to know um, where, you know, the country that you're going to is as far as politics, as far as rights for women, as far as their laws and how they go about and, and handle things. I think that this is a very unique situation because timing has so much to do with it. Um, 
Brittany, I will first say, is an incredible human being. Um, um, people are talking about how she has excelled and how great she is as a basketball player, but she's an even better person. Um, very kind, you know, um, in some cases very soft-spoken, you know, um, because of her abilities, because of her genetics and because of her talent, she was a very shy kid. But I think that she, you know, through sport was able to kind of come in her, into her own and have her own voice and, you know, find her person. Um, but in a place that is, um, you know, kind of going through changes, you know, within their, their government, um, starting a war, you know, there are things that change because of just the delicate nature of that circumstance. And it is unfortunate that um, she has kind of been caught up in, I guess, political warfare, so to speak. But um, in saying that, it's also very important to just know your environment. Um, I believe that even with all the things that we've experienced lately in our country, America is still a wonderful place to be, to live in, to have um, choice, I guess now to a certain extent, that's changed a little bit, um, but to have freedom of speech and movement in a way that cannot be changed in an instant. There at least has to be a process that you have to go through in order to invoke change. Um, it's just, there is no good side of it, you know, in my opinion, because one thing that you can't do is when you leave America, you can't change how people decide to govern and go about things. That's why it's very important, in my opinion, to um, police yourself the best that you can. As comfortable and as free as I felt like I am, you know, when I'm at home, I am never like that when I travel outside of America. I'm just not, I'm never really comfortable. Um, as much as I'm there for, you know, work, I am there for that. Um, I don't celebrate a lot. I don't hang out a lot, I don't party a lot, because it is not my place of home, and I know that I don't have the same rights in my country of origin than I do anywhere else. Um, some would say that is, um, I guess, kind of sad. For me, it's a safe reality. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> BG is amazing, you know, and, to be, to be put in a, such a hard situation. It's one thing, you know, and I mean, we all know this, the crime was done, but the time doesn't match. And I think that's the biggest struggle is, you know, think about any of us being in a foreign country. Like I enjoyed going overseas, played in Russia, played in Poland, played in Turkey, played in Seoul, South Korea, which is my favorite place for four, five, four and a half years. So like being overseas, I enjoyed. And having those opportunities and access to be able, yes, do we need to make more money in America? Of course. Would love for the WNBA to make more money. But y'all were in 26 years. The NBA is celebrating 75, they just celebrated 75 years. And we keep comparing the NBA and the WNBA with a 50 year gap. My dad did not make what they're making now. We are way further along in the WNBA than we were in the NBA when my dad was playing. So keeping things in perspective, the WNBA, Lord willing, will get to an opportunity where we are looking and those million, billion dollar contracts are coming through and we're like, yeah, it's about time, but the process, it's the process. I don't want the WNBA players to have to go overseas. I want them to make money here and be able, but. The rea also, the reality is right now, our season is five months. So for seven months, what else are you going to do? I, I mean, I love practice, <laughs> but I don't like practice for seven months. <laughs> you know, they started a new league, the Athletes Unlimited, went really, really well this year. Shout out to Eileen Hauser, one of our former Nike reps. But that's not enough. And that, they didn't make enough for that to be able to sustain to sustain players in the off season. So I say all of that to say yes. You know, Brittany, I want her home. 
we want a home. We want a home. You know, the crime she did, it's a crime. It is what it is. But the time doesn't match that. And so trying to figure out, I mean, any of us would want the equal time for whatever crime, we need to get her, figure out a way to get her back. I just, I, I know we're, we're nearing close to the end, right? And I just wanted, can I just throw out one question? Please. Um, advocacy for Title IX. You know, obviously that's a huge piece to this audience, the future. The young ones in the audience you've spoken to a lot about social justice and feeling their heart. What kind of advocacy and education can we tell everybody out there that we need right now to take this Title IX 50 to Title IX 75? Like, what's that future look like? How do we impactfully give this to our young students in this audience and some of our educators? What would you say? Um, I would say that um, at some point it is okay to not know. But now that awareness has been provided and it's been put in front of you, there is no reason to not know from this day forward. My experience with Title IX, I didn't become educated enough until I was actually a freshman in college. So I wasn't you know, much older or around the same age as you all. My head coach that I was recruited by, who I adore, Marianne Stanley, um, was going into a contract year. Our women's basketball team was far successful than our men's basketball team, but our men's basketball coach got paid more, far more than she did. So she challenged her contract um, um, in her contract year to um, be paid more money instead of um, paying her equally close to or even more than she was being paid um, at the time. What they did is, which was you know, in, in their right because it was not against the law, allowed her contract to finish. So therefore, when she, she was no longer contractually or the university was no longer contractually obligated, the negotiation ceased. So therefore, she was out of a job. So instead of, in my opinion, doing the right thing, they used the law or opportunity against her. Marianne Stanley, she's going into the Hall of Fame this year, the class of 22. She went on to do great things, but the fact that instead of paying her her worth, you would just decide to kind of do away from, with her was disheartening to all of us. I mean, it really sucked because she is, was a very good coach, great coach actually. For me, that was the moment where I needed to know more I needed to educate myself. I needed to have a level of awareness. And it was something from that point on to the rest of my life, I would have a conversation about. I would advocate for. I would have an understanding so that I could, that I could speak from an educated standpoint, but also along the way, bring people along with me because it absolutely takes us. None of us in this room is here without a mother. Most of us have a sister, an aunt, a grandmother, someone in our lives that are going to be touched by Title IX. So it affects everyone in this room. Not necessarily directly, sometimes indirectly. So if it affects you, it is your responsibility not just to know, but to also advocate. Wow, wonderful. I, I can't follow that up with much more, but I mean, I think it's too, finding out your areas. Title IX is so broad, you can do everything. So find out specifically what areas that you're interested in and where you can be an advocate for and how you can advocate, you know? And it's, it's not men versus women. It's all of us collectively together. I think sometimes it's like, women need this and women need that. And it's, no, like we, the access, having more access, providing more opportunity, that's what it's all about. And collectively working together. 
So find your areas, you know, find what it is that you're interested in and what you want to, once again, going back to what you want to fight for. And maybe fight is not the word, maybe it's advocate. What you want to be an advocate for and how you want to influence certain areas. And not everybody's going to make it on the front page of the New York Times. <laughs> Some of it, a lot of work has to be done behind the scene, the weeds, in the weeds, you're digging and digging and digging. And that might be your job, that might be your role. Or you might be the next step in the implementation plan. Or you might be the next step to be on a panel and talk about what the people and the work that people have done before you. But whatever your space and whatever your role and whatever your time, stand up and be willing to do it. Marty, can I, Marty, can I so add one more we thing? We are out of time. Can oh, I just add one more thing? Please. I, I, I think that, and I, I don't want this to be missed on the room, is that Everyone in this room is impacted simply because we now live in a world in a space where um, working moms are just as important as working dads. So in order to be successful in this world to provide for your family, moms work as well. I was fortunate enough to grow in a household when my dad was the breadwinner. My mom worked, but she was a housewife. Her job did not receive a salary. There's no way that I could provide for my son or my family the way my father did without working. I can't simply just be a housewife. That is a very small percentage of our world where women can be at home and not work. So your mothers, your sisters, your aunts, you are impacted because when they go out into the workforce, what they do, how they're able to do their job, affects how you live, how you pay your tuition, like how you grow, the food that you eat, the clothes that are on your back. It is a part of the growth and the process of your household. So we literally are more impacted now than we ever have been because it is a necessity for women to be able to have the opportunity to provide so that we all survive. Oh, I'll man to that. Yep. Absolutely. So uh, I wanted to ask Aces versus Connecticut Sun who is going to win, but we don't really have time. So uh, I just want to thank you so incredibly much. I mean, what you did here with the basketball on the court, that was amazing. It was inspiring. It was remarkable. But really, the, what you bring to the world every day with your heart, your passion, your intelligence, your eloquence, your courage, what you offered to our audience today is just such a gift. It's really been a wonderful, wonderful day here. And thank you so much thank you. for shining here and with your presence. It's been great for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks yeah, for amazing. having us, guys. Give them a round you. of applause. Thank you. We love oh. presents. Thank you. <laughs> Are we throwing these balls out, or what are we doing with these? Quick picks. Quick picks. We have uh, Maura Healy, the Mass Attorney General. Go, uh, look at that. Look at that. Impressive. You can, keep, you can throw the rest. The, go ahead uh, and throw the rest out. Yeah, that's good. This is like Billie Jean King at commencement. Yeah, we had, Just go ahead. Take them all, me. Go ahead. They're all you. Well, hello, everybody. It's nice for you, to, for you to be here and to be seen. This is an, really an exciting day, but we've taken so much time up with our introductions, we, we need to come to a close. <laughs> These were like the longest introductions. But you've done quite a bit. And Mara, if, if I may, um, I'm not going to ask you any difficult questions for the next half hour. I'm not going to ask you about transportation or zoning. That's welcome. <laughs> This is the birthplace of basketball, and we are celebrating an incredible day here, and we are the last program that we're offering today, so we've got to make it really good. The pressure is the on. on. Okay. But I think the title of it alone, from point guard to a political arena, is it sets the stage for us learning more about you. And I've got lots of questions, but really I want to hear from you. I want to hear about how, and all of our students in the room, that's really your target audience, how did what happened for you in college, playing sport, make all the difference in your career? 
So the floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Cooper. It's great to be here today. Uh, welcome to all the students. I know you're just returning to campus this week, so I wish you the very best in school and on the playing field and, and in court. And um, probably, let's see. And by the way, it's such a treat to walk by the Naismith statue. As a basketball player, it is very cool always to be in Springfield and then to be at Springfield College in particular. And to be here for this event on 9-9, celebrating 50 years of Title IX. And I know that we're going to talk about that. But I really credit uh, Dr. Cooper and the team for your leadership in and to Sue as well for your, your vision in creating this day uh, that I know has been fantastic. I wish I could have been here all day as a basketball junkie, particularly a huge fan of women's basketball uh, and girls' basketball. I would have loved to have listened to all of the earlier parts of, of this program. But um, what was your question? Well, let, let, <laughs> I can tell. I've been let, out in the sun. Let's, let's talk about being a point guard. Are we in a point guard? Yeah, okay. we're going to talk okay. about basketball, but the leadership role of a point guard is unique. Mm -hmm. And I am sure, did you know that you always wanted to be a point guard? How did, how did it come to be, your, your athletic career? Well, I, I guess it started early. I mean, ever since I was a little kid, I loved to have a ball in my hand. Uh, like many of you, I'm sure, whatever it was to, to catch, to throw, I just always wanted a ball in my hand from the time I was two, three, four years old. And then I started playing with kids in the neighborhood. They were all a little bit older. There was a basketball hoop. Uh, but we used to play everything. And growing up, I played a number of, of sports, uh, baseball, basketball. Uh, you know, I, I, the, I ran through the gamut there. But it was just to say that I became a, a point guard, I think simply because I was pretty athletic and could dribble a ball. And if you're in like second or third grade and you can actually be the one who can dribble a ball, they make you a point guard. <laughs> like at that time, you're basically all the same height, right? So like obviously I'm 5'4", so I was only going to be a point guard. But when you're in second or third grade, it's like if you can handle the ball, you're the point guard. And I love being a point guard. I mean, point guards, and do we have any point guards in the room? Get one right here. A few, Emerging. right? All right, great. How's your left hand? Yeah, all right. Well, keep working on that. Thank you. Right. Listen, uh, so point guard. I, I think one of the things I like about being a point guard is that you actually want the ball in your hands. You're the one who's supposed to beat the press and break, break the pressure. Uh, but also, and I think more importantly, you're the one who's responsible for getting people to play as a team. Yes, you're the playmaker. But what that really means is making sure that everybody has their touch at the right time and that you're making things go. You're like the little, the little leader on the court. And um, as I say, I'm 5'4", so I was only the little leader on the court. Um, but you're supposed to be sort of the floor general, right? And I think that that's something that I really took to, and it certainly helped me in other realms of my life, that experience as a point guard. Good. And she's going to work on her left hand. I can see her mom's <laughs> wheels work, working on that. So you went to Harvard, a very fine institution in the state, um, one of our aspirational schools, if you will. But I like to think about the co-curricular experience, and athletics is that. So you went to Harvard, and I imagine that your academic um, rigor was amazing. But you played sports in college, and so we have about 37% of our students play sports, and some play two sports. And we're very proud of that fact, to have a long history in sport. Tell me about how you think sport adds other skills to, to complement the academic side of the house. Well, on that question in particular, I don't know about any of the student athletes here. I always did better in season mm -hmm. because you're sort of forced to be disciplined when you've got classes or some people had labs. I mean, you really have to be on top of it and organized. So I always did better in school when I was in season. And sports, I think, forces, particularly at the college level, I mean, you're not going to be able to play in college unless you understand something about discipline. Uh, and work ethic and you know what that requires and I think that obviously translates to the classroom as well and and the two can complement one another and so I uh, also would say to student athletes and I've had the privilege of hiring a lot of employees over the years uh, in the Attorney General's office before in private practice and I always loved the opportunity to hire student athletes because I knew that they would come 
with the discipline and the ability to manage a few things at once. Many also understood the importance of teamwork, for example, and they also came with the resilience that you know, is required to, to play a college sport um, in terms of the ups and downs and the rigors of preseason and through the season, through wins, through losses and the like. And that's, that's really powerful, those, those superpowers that you have as student athletes, particularly college student athletes. Excellent. So we talk a lot about winning and winning is, is great, but you don't always win. There must have been some experience in, in either in your collegiate career or afterwards that you, you came upon a, a, a challenge or an obstacle. How did you, tell us about one example that comes to mind that either it didn't go the way you thought it was going to go and, and how you responded to it. Because I think one of the things I always like about seeing you and hearing you speak is your resilience and your grit and the fact that you're the, the people's choice. I mean, that to me is quite telling and it fits with our mission. But tell us about a challenging time and how you overcame it. Well, I've had a lot of losses, um, but I do think winning is, is really important and we strive for that. But you learn a lot through any loss. Um, probably for me, I mean, my first big loss was senior year of high school where we were up against what was then the number one team in the country, Nashua High School. And they were ranked number one, Christ the King was number two in New York. But we were number two in the state and we were set for this showdown. And we lost to them on Valentine's Day by, I don't know, 10, 12 points. And I thought this would be the opportunity. And didn't you know it, we lost in the semifinals. I think we choked. We lost in the semifinals. We never made it to the finals. And that really hurt because I had had and we, a really successful run through AAUs and Junior Olympics and through all of my, my high school sports. And that was like, ugh. Uh, but, you know, it just made me work that much harder, I think, to get ready and turn the page to get ready for my college season and getting to college campus. And then the second loss I had that I had to, to overcome was getting injured freshman year where I had some torn meniscus and I'm old, so that's like 92, no, it was not, it, it, late 80s. It was not as proficient, the surgery in those days, so it basically knocked me out for a good part of that season. And, you know, I put on weight, I wasn't able to play, I had to ride the damn stationary bike, which at the time, <laughs> there was like no Peloton. Those things were ugly and heavy, and it was just awful. And it got me really down. And so, you know, I had to figure out a way to work through that, and I will say it took me the better part of that spring to, to work through that. I ended up returning sophomore year in what was and will always be the best shape of my life. My sophomore year in college happened to be the best shape of my life, but I think it's because I had that setback and that time away, and it also made me really appreciate when you get to work out really hard, because I wasn't able to do that, and that I, I learned from. I appreciate that. Thank you for sharing that story. So we're here to talk about Title IX. Right, and it, its impact on you. And given your profession, tell us your thoughts about Title IX. Title IX is a hugely important piece of legislation. It has resulted in huge gains for women. It applies, of course, to athletics, but it applies to education generally. And that's sometimes lost in the discussion of Title IX. You know, back in, back in uh, 1972, it was the case that probably 7% of law degrees and medical degrees went to women. Today, that's almost 50% and since that time. And you know, it's just one example, I think, of what Title IX has, has meant in terms of expanding those opportunities, both in the classroom and outside of the classroom in other important educational settings. Look, I was born in 1971, and you know, when I was starting out playing, when I was in youth leagues, third grade, fourth grade, it was still, there was no girls basketball or anything else. You just played with the boys. And you know, Title IX has really resulted in a huge change. Now we have girls teams and we have girls teams across all sports. That's a big difference. Um, I would say with high school, you know, I, uh, by that time, starting high school in 84 through, through 88, you know, things had started to, to take hold there. It was clear that we were supposed to have, you know, equal practice time and the same quality uniforms and the like. I also was really fortunate to have a strong coach because I know that were it not for the advocacy of the coach at that time, who happened to be a male, we would not have necessarily received that treatment because I think, 
you know, one of my themes today will be, we have to continue. It's not enough that there's a law on the books. It doesn't self-execute. It requires the work of coaches, athletic directors, you know, others in administration to keep, to keep pushing this, to make it, it happen. But it's a hugely important law because of, of what, it, what it inspired. You had two WNBA players here today that are here today because of Title IX. I'm sure that's what they said or would say. And I think for a lot of us, I would not be here today were it not for Title IX because I would not have been given the athletic experiences that I had both in high school and in college that I think gave me confidence, self-esteem, and other things that have enabled me to succeed. And sometimes I've failed plenty, but those successes and my growth are directly tied to what I was able to learn through athletics. And I see people shaking heads who would attest to that. That's, that's, the, that's the importance of, of Title IX. And again, you know, there's a lot more we need to do in terms of enforcing and executing that, but it is incredibly, incredibly um, important. And it, and it warms my heart to see all these, you know, I do some youth coaching now, it, just to know that there are girls teams out there where, you know, I would be one of, you know, one or two girls playing an entire league, or, you know, and, and it's really, really exciting to see what has happened there. Absolutely. Um, last May, we had the opportunity to have Billie Jean King here. She spoke at our commencement, and so it was an exciting day, and she had wonderful messages, and she was one of my mentors as I was growing up. Tell us a little bit about who you looked up to. You talked a little bit about a coach that made um, access and equality uh, a reality. Other people, other coaches, your parents, who has shaped you as you are today? I mean, it, when I was a kid growing up, I always looked up to Nancy Lieberman because she was in the Olympics. And, you know, I'm a kid, right? So at the time, you're like 10 years old and you're doing the math. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to play in four Olympics by, by the time I'm done. <laughs> but, you know, she, I used to do sit up, I used to do like 500 sit ups every night and all these fingertip push ups every single night on, on the floor upstairs of our. our old farmhouse um, because you know somebody like that who was playing gave you that gave you that drive gave you that inspiration and another person was Martina Navratilova um, it's been awesome to watch the the open the last couple of weeks and to see Serena Williams I, I think about Martina Navratilova who was I think to me one of the first people who uh, showed what physical strength looked like and sort of broke uh, a mold there and, and gave, you know, women, now notwithstanding a lot of homophobia and all sorts of other things, but, you know, I, you saw a woman look and be in physically strong and, and then and, and excel, and, and that was an inspiration. Um, certainly my coach, who was really hard. I came to know my, my high school coach uh, when I was uh, 13 years old, and he was my high school soccer and basketball coach, an incredibly successful coach, won many state championships in New Hampshire. Um, he later became my stepdad because when he was coaching us in AAUs at 15, 16, 17 years old, he got to know my mom. So that was a little <laughs> awkward for a bit. But I have to say I credit him because were it not for his discipline and pushing really, really hard, um, as he did my, my two younger sisters who also captained their teams, one of whom won a state championship. I never did. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have been to Harvard and I wouldn't have uh, been, been able to do what I was able to do. So those are some, you know, examples. And, um, and you know there are there are many many others. I am grateful to so many, to so many people along the way. Well, you serve in that capacity for other people, all the people that are in the room. And I just say one thing about Billie Jean King is amazing. She is just <laughs> she never uh, you never tire of listening to a Billie Jean King, and you think about what she went through. It is pretty remarkable. And uh, just seeing her on TV the other night, I just wanted to give it up to to Billie Jean King, so I'm glad you had her here last year. She was great, she was really, and she was great with the students and it made it a very memorable day. But now, back to you. So all of the people in the room here, looking up to you, and I'm sure that feels daunting at times, but what, what's the message that you want these young people to walk out with? You talked a little bit about execution and, and our athletic director in the room heard it, so we've got work to do, we always have work to do in this area. But leaving these individuals with some pearls of advice. What, what do you have for them? Well, um, I guess I, I'd say a few things. Um, 
One thing I'd say is don't underestimate hard work. And I, particularly to, I sound so old now, but like to, uh, You're not that like old. the younger generation, <laughs> like you don't just show up and win the championship, right? Like you've had to have worked your butt off all summer long, preseason, through the ups and downs of a whole season. That formula does not change when it comes to a career or a personal life or a professional endeavor. It's the same formula. So just remember the things that made you successful in sports. And obviously, you wouldn't be playing at the college level if you didn't come with natural ability, which is awesome and for which you should be grateful. But your true success is going to come from the time that you put in. You understand that. And the same will hold true when it comes to a career or other endeavors further further down the line. The other thing is, um, you know, like sports, you're going to go through a lot of ups and downs, and it's the ability to to recognize what it took to win something, but also what you need to do to to not lose, um, and how you bounce back from a loss. That's transferable to everything that you do. The other thing is, I think that. Um, I think a couple, I'll make a couple societal comments. Can I do that? Absolutely. So there's like way too much division right now in our world. And I don't know if, you know, people's inability to kind of engage with one another, talk to one another, sit with one another. I mean, you're not going to have a successful game unless you're playing as a team. Even if you don't necessarily like each other, you still have to work together, right? You still have to play together. And I think bringing some of that mentality to other realms will be really, really helpful as you move forward. And I think those are, you know, there was going to be one other point I made that probably probably I shouldn't make. I don't know, and I forgot it now at this point. But those are some of my um, some of my things I'd want to I'd want to share with you all out there. Oh, I will say one thing, um, and this is what I wanted to say. Um, this is the easiest interview I've ever done. <laughs> well, that means I'm talking too much. No, um, no. I'll, I'll say this. You know, 50 years, Title IX, so many gains, so many gains. That said, there is still a lot to do. The rate of sexual assault, sexual violence, sexual harassment, not just on college campuses, but out there in the world, we know is still way too high. We have major work to do when it comes to diversity. Um, and I'll say this, as hard as it is for women, it's even harder for women of color. Um, and we need to work on this. And it's not just limited to sports, it's across all realms. I, you know, remember walking into my first meeting, I had just been elected attorney general, and I went down to the national meeting of, of AGs, and I was with my uh, state trooper executive protection detail, and one of the other AGs came up to me, came up to us to congratulate the new attorney general from Massachusetts, and introduced himself to my trooper because he looked the part. And we still have a lot of work to do when it comes to representation in government, in boardrooms, in business, and the like. So I would just implore our young people to learn from the mistakes of those who've gone before you and do everything you can to support women and women of color in particular, uh, people of color in particular, those who've been left out and marginalized for far too long. I'll also tell you this, you're going to have a better team. You're going to have a better team, better company, better organization, better government if you embrace that diversity. Um, and finally, to uh, administrators, and I, you know, I know Springfield College has the most incredible history when it comes to athletics and training coaches, athletic administrators, uh, among other uh, professions and, and fields. Um, and I know you all know this here. But looking out across the, the, the Commonwealth and across this country, it's still the case there's a lot of inequity when it comes to sports. The marketing money, you know, we, we see the differences in, in the WNBA and the NBA. We see what women's soccer has gone through. Um, I think it's super cool when I see little boys signing and wanting Sue Bird shirts. When my um, election the other night in the primary, it was pretty cool. Two little boys came up to me with basketballs. I'm used to little girls, but it was great to see two little boys uh, do that. Uh, by the way, I'm not trying to make a connection between myself and Sue Bird. That was terrible. It's just to say, <laughs> but I have talked to Sue Bird about this. The marketing money is real, you know, and, and we have to force um, departments to make sure that they are spending as much, not just on the uniforms, but also on the marketing and branding efforts uh, across this country. We also need to recognize, too, I look at youth sports. I don't know how many 
um, women collegiate athletes, friends of mine who have kids who are playing youth sports right now, who still apparently aren't qualified enough to coach the third or fourth grade team because they're a woman. So inevitably you end up with a situation where you may have a dad who's never played um, a sport or maybe never played that sport, uh, certainly never played at that level, who is chosen over the woman. And that does really irk me. And I would just say, you know, just like all politics is local, all sports is local. So what can we do and drive, not just on college campuses, um, certainly in our high schools, but also when it comes to youth sports, to make sure that we have the role models there and that we are actually, you know, not only putting forward people who are qualified, but also, you know, um, just, just, just changing this because I do see it happen time and time again. And I know people are gonna leave this wonderful institution and be in a position to make sure there are changes there. Wow, that was excellent. And I have to tell you, I'm very glad I'm a female president sitting here. It seems like, you know, there's a lot of things that have happened to me in my career, including, uh, you had a chance to meet my husband, when we have walked in, especially the first few years I was president, when I walked into a new room, and they would immediately go to him. And so you get used to it and you say, well, he, that's what some presidents look like. And some presidents look like this. And so I think the more we find ourselves in, in leadership roles, the more the students today will say, oh, it could be her or him. You know, and I think we have work to do about a lot of different areas. You mentioned many of them. What I really liked uh, to hear you talk more about before we end is teams. You mentioned it in a few of your comments. Is there a team you played on or if you could design a team, what, would you, what, what qualities would you be looking for and who would you want to have around you? Boy, that is, I've been asked a lot of questions. Um, I have never been asked that question. That was a great question. I would say, I'd say one of my favorite teams that I was a part of was a team that I didn't play on but that I coached. I had an experience coaching seventh and eighth grade girls basketball in Somerville, just outside of Boston, um, years ago. And I loved these girls. And because I was sort of the new coach volunteer, they gave me, how do I put it, the, the girls who were not as advanced. Um, so I was basically coaching. <laughs> do you remember the Bad News Bears, that show? Um, we, that's, that's who I was given. And I have to say it was one of the most rewarding experiences and we didn't win a game. We were 0-12. But I can tell you that those girls who, again, you know, were the ones passed over and they came from about four different schools and they were all lumped in together and they didn't feel so good about themselves because they knew that they'd been passed over. Mm -hmm. They just put the time in and it was the greatest team because ultimately they totally supported each other and they improved that entire season. And we had a great end of the season celebration. I'm still in touch with some of these girls. And to me, that was one of my favorite team experiences because you saw them come to know each other and then come to really support one another. And, um, you know, I think teamwork, if I had to put together a team, um, you know, you, you always, you, you take a team over an individual, right? I, you know, you just, it's, it's the rule. It's, it's the rule, I think, on the court, and I think it's a rule for life. Um, and so, you know, I look for, in terms of a team, and by the way, I'm so lucky to have Amy Karen Jenkins here. She runs our Springfield uh, office and does great work, and Elise Yannette is here, too, who helped put this all together and has focused a lot on, on youth sports and combating hate and violence, too. Um, what I look for in a team is people who are about team, who really actually are about team and can put ego aside, who are um, willing to support one another and who are willing to, to step up too. I do think, you know, on my team, I like people who aren't afraid um, and who aren't afraid to fail and who aren't afraid to put themselves out there. And that's a scary thing, but I like people who are at least, you know, life short and just try. And the worst thing that happens is, you fail, but you're going to learn from that. And I also like people who, um, who, um, you know, there's always that, there's always that special quality of somebody who's just willing to step up in the moment, 
um, when you know, you know, things are on the line or, you know, somebody is really willing to step forward and, and take the shot. Um, and that, that to me is, is somebody I want on the team. Excellent, excellent answer. Since you are the People's AG, I'm gonna give somebody in the audience the opportunity to ask one question. Who has one question that they would like to close the interview out with? This is your big opportunity. Okay, Marty. The question was, who's the favorite basketball player of all time? You know, I, I'm partial to Bob Cousy um, because I grew up, my first youth team that I was on uh, was the, the Holy Cross team. I was given a, a Holy Cross Crusaders purple t-shirt when I was in third grade and I wore a purple ribbon. I used to have long, long hair and uh, of course was a Celtics fan. And so I wanted to wear the number of the greatest point guard of all time. And in my view, that was Bob Cousy. And years later when I was running, actually I came to, to meet him and we've become good friends. But he did things on the court that, that innovated and, and transformed the game. So I love, I love Bob Cousy. Um, and uh, I love Sue Bird. I love Sue Bird because I think that, um, you know, what she has been able to do in year after year after year, um, keep herself in shape, keep herself ahead of everybody. I wish I had that drive and discipline and competitive <laughs> Edge that she has, uh, but she's a really remarkable, phenomenal player. Thank you, Marty. And I think you're remarkable as well. Let's give Thank a you. warm yeah. consideration of our time. Thank you all. Best of luck in everything that you're doing. Thank you so much for having me and have a great, great year on campus. Well, we wish you the best of luck as well. And we'd like to be on your team. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for coming. It was great. <laughs>